hope that's clear. So there are three types, three three places where you can use the cache. Database, front end, and back end. So in case your front end server makes a lot of requests to the back end server, put a cache here so that your front end doesn't have to always call the back end, call, takes the information from the cache. Back end server uh, does not have to always make a request to the database. It can always uh, you know, make a request to the cache instead. So that's the three places you can use the cache. Now comes scalability. So we are in a session with by Scalar. Scalar, where you, you think about scale, scale of products, right? So scalability is something that you have to think about when you're designing a system. That's the most core important funda, right? So scalability uh, has three axes, latency, throughput, and capacity. So latency is when you make a request to a server, the response that you get, the, the delay before you get the response is the latency. So the more the latency, that means the more it's taking, the more time it's taking to respond to you, the less the latency, that means that responses are very quick. So you want less latency, okay? People confuse this a lot. They, they think that they want high latency. No, you want low latency because uh, you want as less delay as possible between your responses. Uh, you need to have a high throughput. That's basically how much data can pass through the system at any given point of time. So like it's like Mbps or Gbps, Pbps, right? How much amount of data can pass at a, at a given point of time, like in per second or per minute or per hour. Now, capacity is not bounded by time. There's no per second or per minute. It's it's an entirety how much data can be stored or, or how much data can flow through the system in entirety. Okay. Now, what's important to remember is performance is not equal to scalability. Okay. Uh, performance, basically, you can have very low latency and your system can be highly performant. But if it doesn't have the capacity or the throughput, it won't be scalable. So people confuse this, these two concepts a lot. And in the chat also, you'll see a lot of people asking me this question, same question. Every session I get the same question. Hey, you know, what's the trade-off between performance and scalability? Are they the same? Uh, you know, like many questions around that. And in, even interviewers, they ask you many questions around this. You have to understand performance is a completely different concept. Scalability is a completely different concept. Okay. And these three things are uh, like capacity, throughput, and uh, latency are the three axes of scalability. So scalability, a little bit more about scalability. You have horizontal and vertical scalability. Horizontal basically means you add more servers. So I'll just give you an example, actually, instead of uh, you know going into the jargon of things. Uh, let's say you have an AWS account. You create one EC2 instance, and you start getting some traffic on your website. Now you want to uh, you know you want to ensure that your entire system does not go down. What do you do? You start creating one more EC2 server, one more EC2 server, and you you know, slow, you know basically connect all of them to the entire network, and then you say, okay, I have all these the different uh, EC2 servers, so that even if you know one becomes overloaded, there are more to uh, take up the the load. So you have that's basically horizontal scaling. You keep adding more and more EC2 servers. Vertical scaling is basically, uh, let's say I have an EC2 server. It's a T2 micro server. And I made a T2 medium, T2 large, whatever I keep making it, like I keep increasing the size of the server, uh, it's, I'm scaling it vertically, okay? So that's vertical scaling. So you have two types of scaling. Now uh, to horizontal scaling. Uh, so between horizontal and vertical scaling, horizontal is usually the good type of scaling. It's, it's more, uh, it's, it's better, it's more, it leads to better results. But there are two laws that get applied to horizontal scaling. One is the Andal's law, the other is the universal scalability law. Uh, I will quickly explain these to you. These are uh, slightly difficult concepts to understand, but they're also very important. So I always go through these because they can be very important interview questions, and I don't want you to miss out on interview questions, right? That's what that's why you're probably learning this all this for. And now, uh, again, is, this is not just important for the interviews, but it's also important to understand how how systems work in the real world. So Andal's law is saying uh, this. By the way, you'll have this presentation uh, after the session, so you can zoom in also and see it properly. Uh, but what Andal's law is saying that you keep adding these servers, right? So I have these number of processors that keep increasing; they they keep becoming double. I will get a speed up uh, in my system, so I will get you know two x, four x, six x, ten x speed. I'll, my system will get start getting you know a, a lot of speed but it will all max out at 20x. So more than 20x speed, I get something called as a law of diminishing returns in the sense uh, the speed of the system does not increase after that. And even if I add 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 servers after that, the speed stops increasing. So this is what happens in the real world. In the real world, 
you can't keep scaling unlimitedly uh, and keep getting a lot of speed. Uh, you have to have, uh, you know, at 20x, the, the amount of speed, speed up that you get in the system stops and then you get stop getting any results. Now, universal scalability law says that uh, that it doesn't even happen till 20x. So Amdahl's, there was the Amdahl's law, then came the Gunther's universal scalability law. He says that even 20x you won't get. You'll just get somewhere around 10x, 12x. So here, this line that you see here, the blue line, that's saying that around 12x, you'll start capping out. You won't get any more speed up above 12x. So this was the ideal. You know, it keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. But this is the actual speed up, the, the blue one. Uh, so why why it's why does it happen? It happens because there is something called as a community communication constraint and the latency constraints that get added to the Amdahl's law in the real world, which make it uh, you know which make the speed up impossible after twelve x. So that's uh, important to understand because when you're working with so many servers, you get communication constraints. You can't like communicate all the servers at the same time. Uh, you have to use load balancers and in, uh, latency is induced between, because they have to communicate with each other. So all of that happens. So you don't really get more than a 12 X, uh, scaling. Okay. Then, uh, you can scale with the help of distribution. So you can distribute data in the sense, uh, from your application, you store the data in three different databases. Or you can distribute compute. You can, you know, use four different servers to compute the information by dividing them into small parts. Or you can replicate data. So there's a main data store, which is your main database. It creates two small replicas so that even if the main database goes down, one of the two replicas becomes the main database. So they are all communicating with each other, and then you know one of the databases, the replicas, becomes the main data store. So with state, how do you scale with state? There are two ways. One is the stateful way of scaling, the stateless way of scaling. So it's a stateful server. So when we used to use PHP long back, right? Technologies like PHP, uh, we had uh, state-based servers. So in the sense, you were storing the session, session information on the on the server side. The problem is that for the client A, client A being the front-end server or, or just the client, the client A is making a request to server one. And server one has the data for client A. So if server one goes down, client A cannot ask server two for the information because only server one has the session information for client A. And that's the problem, right? So if client B goes down, uh, client B cannot ask server one or server two for any information because only server two had that information. So that's the problem. Where with stateless systems, you have multiple servers and all of these servers don't store any session information. All the information is only stored in the databases. So you can use load balancers here and they can simply redirect the traffic to any of these servers. Now, even if one server goes down because the servers were not storing any session information anyways, even if one of the servers goes down, you can the load balancer can send the request from uh, the, the client to any of the servers, and it will all work perfectly and smoothly. So stateless systems are better. And in, in modern system design, we always use stateless. So you uh, you know you just want to understand that modern systems are all about, all about stateless, and we'll be using that in today's system design. Uh, this can be a big question, big in interview question. Uh, you know, if you, you know, which, which one scales better or what is state, all of that stuff. Uh, now you know the answers. Okay, so important topic, sharding. Your databases cannot keep endlessly storing information because they start failing, right? They start going down. You, you've seen databases getting overloaded, all those problems. So how do you scale databases? You scale them by sharding them. So you create either vertical shards or horizontal shards. Vertical shards, what you do is you divide the uh, columns into different databases. With horizontal shards, you divide the rows in different databases. So here's the original table. The first vertical shard will have first name, last name. Second vertical shard will have the city. So you've divided from the columns. The columns you have divided into two different databases. So now it becomes easier to store information. And similarly, you can keep dividing into more and more shards. With horizontal shards, uh, you can store between Let's say the first two rows you store in the first database, the second two rows you store in the second two databases, second database. Now, uh, obviously, this is an example, right? So many people, they don't understand that, that I'm just taking an example. So they ask me a question in the chat saying, hey, for four, if this is such a small database. Why do you need to, why do, you need to do any sharding? I'm just showing you with a small example. This is a small database. But uh, you know, in, in reality, you would have like thousands and thousands, millions of records probably. 
that's where you do horizontal sharding and you'll have thousands of columns that's where you'll do vertical sharding right uh, i'm just showing you using a small example how it how it actually works database is replication so you have the original database and it uh, stores information in in replicas okay so if even if the original database goes down one of the replicas can actually become the original database now the problem here uh, that you need to know that you know replication sounds like a really good silver bullet it, it can solve everything but it's not the case you need to know the problems or the cons uh, behind replication of databases the problem is that it can lead to inconsistency in the system so uh, whenever there's some new information that gets written from the server to the original database that needs to traverse through all of the replicas and all of them need to have like a consensus that this is the new information so all of them get updated but if uh, there's some new information in the original database and before it's able to write information to them it goes down it crashes right there's an attack on this database then that information is lost and one of the replicas who now has to become the original database the main database will not have that recently written information and that's when the entire system becomes uh, inconsistent with each other and that's the problem so that's the problem with replication you need to know that uh, inconsistency can occur in the system so with systems where consistency is of critical importance like payment right you don't want to have multiple payments or if payment has gone through you didn't store it in the database that that's a big problem right payments you might want to refrain from using too much replication or you might want to have different strategies okay indexing of databases so let's say you have a table which has id name and city and you had sorted by id which is you know auto increment ids stored by ids and you have name and cities uh now what if you wanted to be able to search much easily much easier from the table what if you wanted to be able to search uh, in a in a better way what you could do is you could put an index on name on the name field you put an index that means that the data will be organized based on names so like andrew blake day so from a to z we have organized it now what happens is that when you have let's say ten thousand records right and you put an, an index on the name now you know whenever you search for let's say zach this guy called zach our system knows that there's an index based on name so if there are ten thousand records the first nine thousand records it does not have to search just needs to search the last 1000 records or maybe even the last 500 records that's it so that's the beauty of using indexes otherwise you would have to go through the entire database all the 10000 records and that will be very slow this is why indexing makes searching for data faster so you indexed based on the name sql versus no sql so with sql you have rdbms systems we all know what are sql databases no sql there are multiple types of no sql databases you have key value stores you have graph dbs you have document dbs and you have column dbs column stores okay no sql databases are horizontally scalable so like mongodb right you don't have to have a strict schema even if uh, there's a schema less information completely okay you don't have to uh, do any painful migrations in our case a no sql database is going to be very good we're going to have a microservices system where we'll have like multiple databases, different types of databases with different microservices, but mostly we'll be relying on NoSQL databases because uh, the information that you get from each stock, it keeps changing that the same number of fields are not there for all stocks. So we want to have something that's that can work with a very flexible or a dynamic schema. So we'll be using NoSQL databases mostly. Row DBs versus column DBs. So row databases, you store a lot of rows, uh, uh, like, you know, a uh, few rows in the databases but in the column databases you store let's say the id column in a database or name column in another database and so on you can you know, store based on columns uh column databases so some so in in our system right there'll be a service a service for stock data so we'll be having like stock related information and uh this is usually a read heavy information so users are always reading this information stock related information and this is usually a read-heavy read system. So for read-heavy systems, uh, you are better off using column uh, stores or any other use case, like let's say analytical or analytics engines, you know, creating data visualization, all of that. Column data is really, really good. So column databases are like uh, Cassandra. They're, they're a very good fit out here. Proxies. So you have forward proxies and you have reverse proxies. Proxies, basically, if you are using, if you're exposing your servers, to the internet 
you want to hide the IP addresses and the location of your actual servers. So for example, if you have clients uh, who are going to, um, you know, like make a request to your front end servers, the uh, location of your front end servers can be hidden with the help of a forward proxy. Uh, whereas if you have your front end servers and your other external systems integrated with your servers, you can have a reverse proxy to hide the IP addresses of the uh, back end servers. If the external systems, like external uh, integrated systems, they come to know the location of your or the IP addresses of your servers, they are going to attack it and and you know uh, get your systems to go down or steal all the information. You don't want that, so this is why you use proxies. Okay, then you have rate limiters. Now, when you uh, have systems like uh, stock trading platforms, a lot of bots, trading bots, they end up using the platform as well. So I'm sure all of you who are Python developers, you all, you've already probably built your own stock trading bot in the past. When you use these kind of bots, or, or maybe scraping bots, right? You scrape all this information. Uh, a lot of competitors, right? They scrape information from others' platforms. So this happens a lot in at least in crypto platforms. So what happens is that you have uh, a, a crypto exchange and the other crypto exchange has uh, you know, some, like is, is trading at different values and you're trading at different values. The customers are going to go the, to the place where there are the, the stocks are cheaper, the cryptocurrencies are cheaper. So you want to keep always scraping their information because they're obviously not going to share their APIs with you ever. Uh, so you have to integrate, you have to keep scraping their platforms just to be updated with the latest information on their websites. So, so like I said, there are a lot of bots or a lot of uh, external APIs who may be integrated with you guys who are making too many requests to your server, or, or somebody who's make, trying to you know uh, use like a Hydra or something to to make too many uh, login attempts, uh, like Medusa or something to make too many logging logging uh, login attempts to you know try to log in and he's getting failed login attempts. So uh, you want to have a system which says, hey, you you from your IP address, you as a user, you've tried too many times. I can't allow you to try this too much, more any more time because you've, you've exhausted exhausted your rate. That's called as rate limiters. If you don't have rate limiters, your entire system can be brought down. Like I said, you know, your system can be overloaded with just a few uh, users who can make too many requests in just one second. Um, with with technologies like Golang, you can parallelize. You know, you can run so many processes in parallel. And you can all make all of them make a very fast attack on on a website, and you can bring them down. So this is why you need rate limiters. Uh, the most important concept in system design is cap theorem. Cap theorem basically says uh, that you can't have all three, which is CAP, all three together. So C is consistency, A is availability, P is partition tolerance. Uh, if any of you guys are from the uh, from the blockchain background, you probably know about the um, the blockchain trilemma, where you know that all three things cannot exist at the same time. So here in, in Web2 world, also you have uh, see the CAP problem where, uh, so let me go through all the concepts together. So consistency basically means, let's say there are two databases. They are consistently talking to each other. And the two databases, if you make a request to both the databases and they give you back the same information because they were in communication, right? They were in communication with each other. So when you make a request to them, they give you back the same information that was the recently written information. Uh, and the information the same from both the databases. That means both the databases or the entire system is consistent. Available basically means if you make a request to the database, it responds back in a given amount of time, like let's say one second or two second, the system is available. That's availability. It, it returns back data in a given amount of time. Partition tolerance basically means uh, let's take the example again of those two databases that were in communication with each other. And if the communication breaks down between the two databases and you still make a request to them, they still give you back the same information, the recently written information, which is consistent. That means the databases or the system is partition tolerant. In the sense, even if there is the communication has broken down between them, this, they return the same information, they're both uh, they're, they're partition tolerant. So you understood consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, but you also need to understand that all three CAP cannot exist together. You can't have all three together. So you always have to prioritize. Now there's a hack. The hack is that with microservices, you can decide which microservice uh, can get what priority. You can either have CA or CP or AP, depending on 
uh, each microservice. Or otherwise, if you don't use microservices for the entire system, you have to pick one CA, CP, or AP, one of these three. And only that you'll have to, you know, prioritize for the whole system. Um, okay, so let me give you an example just to make it clearer. Availability, basically, uh, like a like Facebook or Instagram, you always go there, you always want uh, to see it live. You, you don't want the website to be down ever. Or Amazon.com, they need high amount of availability. Uh, anything that has a lot of payment related information, right? You're, you're making some transactions. Availability is not important. Consistency is very important because uh, even if the system is down, it says payment failed, sorry, servers are down, like Google Pay tells you servers are down. That is acceptable to you. But if money goes twice or three, thrice, you will panic, right? So consistency uh, is more important than availability there. Whereas on Instagram, if the same post gets shown to you twice, you don't care, right? Availability is more important, not consistency. So you have to pick and choose uh, you know, based on your system. And we'll do that. We'll also pick and choose based on our system uh, when we actually start going through the board. So microservices, you have, uh, when you start out with any product, you usually have it as have it as a monolith in the sense you have a UI layer, you have a business logic, and you have a data access layer. And it exists in one big chunk called the monolith. And microservices, basically, you start dividing those monoliths into very small chunks called microservices, uh, where you start dividing the business logic into different parts. It makes it much easier to handle, much more easier to work with. And uh, a great pattern is to give a separate database to each microservice. API gateways. Now, when you're using the microservice pattern, uh, you don't want your front end to go and you know, find or go and do the work of finding which service has what data. So you want to use something called as an API gateway, which is like the single entry point for each, for all the APIs, or the single entry point for the front end to interact with any of the APIs. So it's the API gateways problem to find out which, uh, you know, server or which uh, microservice has what data, the front end just needs to make a request to the API gateway. Otherwise, the front end would become really overloaded. So it's a single point of entry for uh, for the client. Now, API gateways don't exist in isolation. Many times, what you'll do is, uh, this is an important point, guys. If you're not paying attention, please uh, just listen to what this one sentence very carefully, that many times in API gateways, you might be seeing that API gateways already have a rate limiter uh, and proxy already implemented. Sometimes even load balancers are implemented inside the API gateway itself, right? So load balancers, rate limiters, proxies, all these three can actually be implemented inside the API gateway. But in mostly like 99% of the systems, you'll see that there's a separate load balancer and you'll see that rate limiters and proxies might be in API gateway, but load balancer is always separate. Okay, so that's, this is, at least what I've seen in most of the systems, uh, even in the later systems, this is how it, it happens. People have started using rate limiters and proxies and they've started rolling that up into an API gateway just to make things more efficient. API composers. Now, we, when we have like multiple microservices, a lot of data exists in different services. So you have like authentication information or user information somewhere else and what the user traded all, all his trades in some other place. And you want all of that information together. And since which user did which all trades, you want all of that information together. Uh, it, it's difficult. It's an expensive process. It takes a lot of time. It's uh, aggregation, right? So, you know, aggregation and joins. When you have to join the information, not just from two databases, but also from two different microservices, which have their own databases. And they might be storing information there in their own formats. Uh, one could be uh, a... Um, no SQL database, the other could be an SQL database. So that's a huge amount of complexity. And you don't want the API gateway to struggle there. So you use something called as an API composer that does the work, the, the, all the pre work of aggregating this information from multiple services and keeping it in sort of a cache so that you don't have to actually make those uh, joins in real time. All the, all the joins already happened and API composers do them beforehand and keep the data ready. So API composers are extremely important. Service registries, when you use, uh, you, don't, you don't just allot one server to one microservice. In the real world, you use containerization, you, you, you use container orchestration, and you know, a lot of complex uh, stuff, right? Com container orchestration. With each deployment or with any change or any new microservice, the IP addresses keep changing very often. We know that. But the API gateway won't sometimes know 
uh, like many many of the times it won't know which which IP address is the latest IP address for which service. So it will make a request to the service registry. There's something called as a service registry. The sole job of the service registry is to uh, take you know, into account what is the IP address of which service. And the API gateway just makes a request to the service gateway, uh, service registry, gets the IP addresses, then calls the relevant microservice and gets the data. Now you might have this question. Right. So if you're new to system design, you might have this question that why do I need a separate separate thing called a service registry? Why do I need something thing called as gateway? Why do I need API composer? Can't I have just one thing which is help, which will have all, all of this? So the answer is no, because all of these have their own underlying data structures and algorithms. They all work in a different way. They all have their own uh, you know, specialization. They're all different technologies. Like load balancer is a very specialized different technology. API gateway is a very specialized different technology. And you want to have all of these things as separate as possible because they'll have single responsibility or separation of concern. Even if one thing, even if your API gateway goes down, doesn't mean the load balancer also has to go, go down. Right? So always think in a um, you know single responsibility way of thinking. Don't think that you can crowd everything together and just again make a big monolith. Right. So always think that all these things will be separate. Uh, Web hooks. So instead of so the the way we will be integrating uh, our system with uh, external systems like in our in our. Uh, stock trading platform. The way we'll integrate these systems will be we'll be using uh, webhooks instead of just API integrations because uh, the information in a stock trading platform it changes very often. You don't want the external systems to keep making requests to you all the time. Okay, you don't want them to keep making requests because that's basically pulling constant pulling of your APIs and your system gets overloaded. You don't want that. You want a webhook where uh, whenever we have an update, like here we have taken the example of Stripe, wherever we have an update, we um, send the update to the external service saying that, hey, now we have an update, we have an update, and this is the new update, this is what has happened, this is the information that you requested for, you need to subscribe to this information, instead of them calling our API again and again to check for new information. Okay, so this brings in an element of event drivenness, even with our external interactions with external services. So today we'll be learning a lot about event driven systems, but even before we go into that, I'm just clarifying that even with the external services that we deal with, we will be, be dealing with them in a very event driven way. We won't be, uh, you know, just having API integrations. Uh, talking about events, you have these the standard request driven architecture where you where the client makes a request to the server and he gets a response back. So here the client has to wait for a very long period of time, and uh, so this is like synchronous communication, right? You send a request, you wait for a response. Whereas if you want to get asynchronous, you can use event driven architecture. So synchronous basically is like uh, you know having a video call with somebody, asynchronous or or, or having a WhatsApp call with somebody. Asynchronous is like have sending him a voice note. So whenever he has time, he can just look at it. Okay. So asynchronous works better for us because it's non-blocking. You don't have to keep waiting for something. And it, it can happen really fast and it supports real-time uh, you know, platforms. So what happens is like let's say you have a server which has a new event. So like let's say, you know, you uh, th there's a trade that happened, a, a buy or sell order that just happened. And this this event needs to con be consumed by different other services to let's say send an email or send a notification, all of that stuff. And they can simply respond to those events quickly. They don't have to now, you know, uh, keep waiting, keep calling these APIs. We'll dig into this much deeper onto the on the board that I have for you guys. So even if you just understand that there's a difference that you know, there's synchronous, sacred synchronous, and instead of calling APIs, we, we have something called as events now. So here, like you can see, you know, you have, uh, in events flowing through a stream, which again we'll discuss in a while. Events happen through two things: queues and streams. So with queues, you get ordered data. So you can keep publishing information in a queue, and then you get you know all that ordered data. You can keep subscribing to it. And uh, usually we use them with workers. So workers are independent programs, parallel con concurrent programs that work from the message queue, and then they they. Uh, you know, do a particular task, a very specific set of tasks, depending on what type of event they received on the event queue. So there could be workers who are listening to a specific event. Whenever they get that event on the event queue, they then execute the particular task. That's how this works, basically. 
Then you have data streams. Data streams are, um, they process data in real time. So you have sources and you have producers, consumers. Uh, now you don't need to get into all this in depth because today we're just talking about very basic stream processing. Uh, you don't have to know the underlying concepts of how uh, you know, something like Kafka works. We won't get into that today, but you need to know that uh, data streams basically work in real time. Now, uh, it's it's okay if, if this is not very clear to you. All you need to understand right now in this presentation is that data streams work with unordered data and they work with real time data processing. And only if, it, if this, this much you've understood, that's okay, because on the board, we'll dig down deeper. Producers produce events, consumers consume events, adapters make sure that the data on the uh, stream is compatible with all the consumers. Brokers basically enable systems to communicate to exchange information. Like I said, you don't need to understand these. It's completely okay if you don't understand any of, the, any of this. Just understand data stream has a lot of data flowing through it in real time. Data gets processed in real time. You drive analytics and reports and all of that in real time. We'll dig, dig into that deeper. Now, the big confusion here comes from the fact that if, what, if these are streams, what are batches, right? So batches and streams are both get, going to get used in our system today. So we need to talk about both. Stream processing happens in real time, whereas batch processing happens at a particular time of the day, like you know, 12 p.m. or 1 p.m. or something like that. So with batch processing, you can use, you have limited resources. You can use those resources uh, at a particular time of the day to process a lot of information. Stream processing, you can process everything in real time uh, if you have a lot of resources. Uh, so like I said, you know, the, the reason we were learning about streams is because real-time systems, they use streams. So stock trading apps, in our case, they're slightly hybrid. 95% is real-time systems and 5% is request-driven response. So we'll, we'll have an element of both in our system design. And um, real-time systems, uh, especially like stock trading apps, we they are near real-time in the sense a few milliseconds of delay is completely okay. They are soft real-time in the sense if the delay increases, it won't hamper anything. It's not mission critical. And it's it's not at all hard real time. Now hard real time systems are where you send missiles and you know you have to click on buttons and you send missiles. So they basically, uh, if there the delay increases, then the system completely fails. So you can't. It's not a hard real time system. That's to do with embedded systems and hardware and all that stuff. With, with us in the software world, we work with near real time system and software real time systems. Okay. Uh, that's about it. Okay, so yeah, last thing I think is uh, WebSockets. So we'll be using WebSockets to send notifications to the front end. So a lot of people get they get confused at how does the front end get all those front end or the app or the web app, whatever. How does it get so many notifications or, or the real time information that's flowing through those graphs? How does that happen? Uh, WebSockets are very heavily used in stock trading platforms. Instead of making a request and getting a response again and again, what you do is you just make a handshake, WebSocket handshake. And then the web server can keep sending you data one after the other. You don't have to make any request. So it's asynchronously pushing data to you, like all the notifications of the real-time information, whenever the web server has any update on the information that you're supposed to see. So that's basically your web sockets. Now let me, um, so the first part of the system is over. Okay. Um, how are you liking it, guys? Is it is it good? Okay. Awesome. Great. So it's it's going great till now. Okay. Uh, some people are saying it's it's a bit bit fast, but uh, we have to do that, guys, because this was the basics of system design. Uh, we we went through it because. Um, we went through it because you know, like I wanted everybody to be on the same page. That's it. All right. So I think it's going good. So everybody is saying it's going good. All right. So what we'll do is now we'll take I'll take some quizzes just to understand if you guys uh, understood what I just showed you guys. So let me take a couple of quizzes. So whoever wins this quiz obviously gets. Uh, a lot of goodies. Uh, yes, by the way, you, you guys will get that presentation in the WhatsApp group created by Scalar after the session is over because I have to export that into PDF and I have to send it to somebody who will then send it to you guys on the WhatsApp group.
Okay. All right. So the next quiz. So many of you who. Uh, Many of you who didn't probably understand uh, things from the presentation, now is a great time to learn from the quiz. You can understand, you know, uh, if you didn't get something right, you'll know what the right answer was. Okay, next quiz, what is a CDN? Nice. So most of you are answering all the questions correctly. Like more than ninety percent of the people are answering all the answers answers correctly, which is awesome. Uh, that means you guys. This is what I check. You know, before we proceed, I just check if everybody has understood uh, what I was uh, saying till now. So it seems like everybody has understood the entire all the concepts, <laughs> which is awesome, guys. Makes me really happy. <laughs> all of you have understood everything. Awesome. Um, Just a couple more quizzes so that we know that everybody's on the same page. Okay, today I think you guys are very smart because more than 90% of the people are answering everything correctly. So we have, I think, a very much, much more intelligent audience than usual. Awesome. Okay, guys, so most of you got everything correctly. So this is perfect. I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, Omkar is saying free sessions have the smartest folks. <laughs> All right. So break will be in about like 15, 20 more minutes. We guys, we have not even started. We, we were just doing like, you know, we're just understanding the basic concepts of system design till now. So we're done with the first, first part of the, uh, of today's session, right? So we're done with this part, which is the 45 minutes learning system design and the five minutes of quiz and uh, questions. This break will take about 10 minutes later because I have to give you some, uh, you know, knowledge, some, uh, what do you call it? Information about what we are supposed to do next. And then we'll take a quick break. Okay. Um, now you you have a lot of information now, right? So I will start zooming in to these boards. Now this board, somewhere around 9:30, 9:45, I will give you access to this board, right? After we come back from the break, I'll give you access to this board. The first few minutes, I don't want to give you access to this board because I want you to uh, not get confused. So let me take you through this board so that you don't get confused when I give you the access, which is after the break today. Uh, I'll give you the access to the board. So. Um, this board has this line, okay? You'll get access to it, but just, just note that there's this line here, a dotted line. You uh, Everything that's above this line is something that will be of immense help to you in all of your interviews in the future, whenever you plan to give a system design interview. This will be of a lot of help. The information I've kept here is um, you know, from a lot of books, a lot of uh, Medium blogs. By the way, you should you you should read Netflix blog, Uber blog. They have their engineering blogs and engineering YouTube channels. So a lot of this information is from those places, right? From very deep resources. Um, all obviously you're getting all of this for free, so that's amazing for you. But also you'll always have access to this board, so you can always come back to this board. You can always learn from this. But I'm just telling you that I'll just show you the kind of information you have here. So just about load balancing like you know load balancers you have a lot of deep information about load balancers you know how how they work like static and uh, and dynamic load balancers how server selection works categories benefits topologies if you want to get very deep into load balancers 
all of that information is here. Okay. If you want to get really deep into scalability, all of that information is here. Uh, like you know, along with the formulas and all that stuff, right? How how mathematically how scaling works. If you want to get really deep into caching, right? So this is almost like reading a book on caching. All the information I have here, it's almost like like reading a book. Uh, it's you know, the the deepest information you might find on the internet. Uh, it's not you, you like it's difficult to find all this, right? I've invested hours and hours onto this. Uh, you know, from my own, when I used to study from my own notes, from, you know, all the articles that I keep reading now. Uh, so you're getting a lot of value in this, in today's session. Okay. So caching, you get all of this, uh, like you can go really deep into caching uh, with, with diagrams. You get information with all these diagrams, how caching actually works, you know, what type of caching is there. Uh, and all of these can be a separate interview questions. So I'm just telling you that, you know, all of these, how cash replacement works, or what are the different cash replacement strategies? Uh, how, how does all of that work and cash replacement with machine learning? How does that work? All of that information is already here, right? So this is all the information that if you want to go into depth in any of these topics, if you want to get go into depth into, let's say, cap theorem, how does that work? So you have that information here. Um, then you have information about uh, rate limiting. So we talked about rate limiting, but there are so many different algorithms for rate limiting. How do all of them work? I've shown you with diagrams. You don't, you don't get this kind of information, guys, on the internet, right? Like with diagrams, you get all this information here. And um, so if you want to go into depth in rate limiting, into uh, into proxies, how proxies work in depth, all of that information is also here. And for advanced reference only, uh, there are multiple advanced architectures like Delta, Sagas, Lambda, and Kappa architecture. All of that is also here. So, like I said, above this line is something you don't want to look at. Uh, you will, like right now, this is only for your reference only after the session is over, or if you want to prepare for system design interviews, want to go into depth, this is what you want to refer. Uh, all of the things that we'll tackle today in today's session will be below that line, okay? Below that line, mostly. Uh, I think Varun has joined back the session. I have, I have, I have. Uh... Hi, Akhil. I, I believe you're going on a break. Yes. So, guys, what we'll do is now is we'll take a quick break, about 10 minutes. And uh, and then I'll see you after the break. I'll stop sharing my screen also, Varun, so that in case you want to. Sure, share sure, screen, sure, sure. And I will turn off my camera. So, guys, after this break, we will, uh, you know, do all the things below that line, which I just showed you. I'm going on a break, 10 minutes. You can take a break if you want. While Akhil is on his break, uh, hi guys. Okay, I see you soon. Um, I did attend the last five minutes. Um, uh, okay, Bhagwati has an issue. Uh, Shri, are you there? So there is uh, the WhatsApp group seems to be full. If you can just update that, and okay. if the guys don't worry, there will be uh, there will be additional links to uh, to the. WhatsApp group, additional groups will be there. So it's not like that. Okay, Akhil's going to be back in 10 minutes. Meanwhile, what we are, what we are going to do is, I'm sure you would have attended all these, uh, you know, many cohort based sessions or master classes and, and many other sessions where you, where they idly do come, you know, come in and give you a pitch towards the end of the session. Uh, we'll not do that. I'll just take quick five to 10 minutes uh, to maybe introduce you to what Scalar is, how we do it, what we do. Uh, because most of you do also know what Scalar is about, uh, but uh, a few who do not know or who are new, unke liye, for them, what Scalar is, I'll give you a quick uh, walkthrough as to what we do, how we've been, uh, how we've, what we've done thus far, and what is the type of dent that we've created in the, uh, you know, in the tech landscape of the country. Uh, what is Scalar and what was Scalar start? How did Scalar start? So Scalar essentially, as you all know, started, was founded by Anshuman Singh and uh, Abhiman New. Uh, Saxena Anshuman Singh is the person who 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 was the engineering lead for uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, in fact, you know the first of its uh, it was actually something which changed the landscape of Messenger. So uh, they had a dream to you know sort of further uh, India's uh, you know push towards being the top, uh, the, being the tech capital of the world and bringing our pay scales, our, you know, our basically respect in terms of our capabilities to the top uh, of the world uh, on par with what the Silicon Valley talent are being paid or, uh, or the type of work that they do. And that's how Scalar started. Scalar's full stack engineering program or 
uh, something which has to do with the system design, high level design, soft, you know, low level design, uh, problem solving, DSA. Uh, that is covered in the software development program. And then there's the newly launched data science, which is no, no longer new. Uh, in fact, in September, around October, we'll complete one year of that program also. That is for folks who want to make a career in data science. Uh, since we are all here talking about making a, an app, uh, a developer, or, or you know picking up developer skills in you know high level design um the academy program is what we'll be speaking about here what does the academy program by scalar include it's a 10 to 14 month uh, program it is equally for those who are you know very new who, who idly have only a few months of experience under their belt as a, a tech professional i might not just say as a software developer should be a tech professional is what all that is required from there to even folks who are you know engineering managers or engineering leads, they we've got a scope of uh, you know including them in the advanced uh, batches. So there's a beginner batch, there's an intermediate batch, and there's an advanced batch. Uh, while you know the offerings, I'm, I'm sure you know uh, there are live classes. There are no record, so recorded classes will be made available to you, but it's idly live classes whose recordings will be available to you uh, on your dashboard. Uh, we'll be coming to the curriculum later, and there you know the entire. Uh, pedagogy of teaching includes one-on-one -on -one mentorship, 24-7 uh, doubt solving, and you know industry projects, open projects and scale-up. Um, apart from that, the background. Who is this for? Uh, like I said, it's for anyone who comes from an engineering, maths, uh, IT background, QA, if you're a QA, if you're a tester, want to switch, this is for you. Uh, all you need to do is you know clear the entrance test that we have. It's, it's mostly an aptitude-based test with one or two questions of coding, even if you don't solve the, that question, you will still be able to crack the 16 MCQ questions that will be there. Um, you know, soon after, if you speak yes to speak with the career counselor, the career counselor will help you with the entrance tests link. Uh, don't fear, even if you fail that test once, you have three opportunities. So uh, don't worry about, you know, or don't take time to, you know, you'll need time to prepare. It's fairly easy. It's an MCQ best. Test has a lot of aptitude-based questions also. All we need to know is whether you have the capacity to learn or not. Uh, here are some outcomes which Scalar has had over the years. The average salary, I'm sure you would all have gone through the KPMG uh, unit audited report and Scalar's placements. Uh, on an average, we've had 94% uh, placement rate. So of every 100 people who've enrolled with us, 94 have been placed. If you have a question, what happened to the, the six? Um, there are cases like people don't, you know, happen to complete the program. Okay. The program is not full. It's not a full-time program. The program is a part-time program. Uh, you have two to three classes a week. Uh, there are week. We, we started recently started weekend batches also, if you don't want to do the weekday one, but ideally we recommend, you know, do the week weekday ones because the entire week you are working also and learn, you know, going through the scalers course. So that will need, give you some time on the weekend to sort of have a mental refresher. Um, the highest CTC that we've placed is 1.7 CR, uh, which of course, you know, freshers don't take that package. So average is 20 lakhs. Of course, you know, the highest is 1.7 CR. 7 CR. Uh, lowest would be obviously lower than the average package. Uh, but the average hike that we've seen is 1.6 percent, which, which translates to 2.3 times. So imagine what is your CTC now? If you pass out from Scalar's program, on an average, you should expect making 2.3 times that amount. Uh, and you know the promotion rate is also one very big factor. Of all the people who've passed out of Scalar, we check back with them one year after passing out from Scalar. In their you know current, they approximately 30% of people were promoted within one year. Uh, the average industry promotion is three years, like every three years or two years, if best case scenario. Uh, scalers alumni see 30 percent promotion rate uh typical batch profile again if you see you know it's uh i don't know whether you can see uh i'll probably speak it out loud if you have 10 percent of the people who have 10 plus years of work x zero to 50 percent of the people approximately are between zero to two years so uh, it's a fairly young uh peer group a young learning community uh five to ten years again has a 25 percent share and two to you know uh, Sorry, two to five years has equal share. So 25-25% here, uh, approximately 45% in zero to two years, and 10 plus years has around 10%.
uh, pre-scaler roles, you know, software engineers were around 70%, but there were other IT and other adjacent tech roles also, uh, a solutions architect, a system engineer, uh, those kind of roles. Uh, Non-IT business roles also make 20% of the cohort. So it, it doesn't mean that if you don't have a coding background, you won't make it, you will make it. Uh, Pre-scaler salary is also something which could, you could you could look at. To give you an idea, average pre-scaler salary was around 8 lakhs. And average post-scaler salary is 21, 22 lakh CTC. Here's the curriculum. Uh, so if you're joined, if you're a non-coder, what is recommended for non-coders is the beginner uh, batch, join the beginner batch. That also has two parts, beginner complete and beginner refresher. Basis, your background, if you are coming from zero, no coding background, recommend beginner complete or if you have some amount of have had previous experience in beginners, uh, you know, there's a refresher for that you can join. Then for people who have some amount of basic coding knowledge, uh, they have the intermediate module. Advanced module is again for the folks that I told you are already software engineers, software developers who are doing it. So they can quickly join the advanced module. Um, a detailed curriculum brochure will be shared with you, uh, with your career counselor who will get in touch with you or in the subsequent emails that will be shared with you after uh, attending session. Don't worry about it. A deep curriculum also exists on the website. You can download from there. Okay. In the curriculum also, there's a specialization that you can choose. You can either go for the full stack engineering with backend expertise or go for the data engineering uh, specialization. Irrespective, career support, placement support exists for everyone it's irrespective of which batch you join um what is career support uh, apart from you know in helping you you know with mock interview rounds for the type of company that you want to get into your linkedin profile will be a you know uh, you know there will be mentoring sessions there will be linkedin profile repositioning sessions hr rounds resume you will be helped end to end apart from that there will be job opportunities also it's not like it's just uh, training on your interviewing skills, but job opportunity. We've got more than 600 plus employer partners. Uh, like you can see, these are the type of employer partners we have got Adobe, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Qualcomm, uh, Goldman Sachs, you name it. And the, you know, the tech company exists, Silicon Valley companies also how to enroll. Uh, I've already told you here are a few alumni and you know, success stories are not one, five, three, eight. The slide needs to be updated. I'm sorry. Uh, we have more than. 3000 success stories uh, or 3500 in fact uh, right now uh, in the kpmg audit you'll see more than 2700 uh, you know alumni is being placed uh, to to give you a surprise in fact we have uh, an alumni who joins us today uh, i don't know whether you're here bhargav are you here give me a quick hi Yes, I'm here. Hi. I can see you. Hi, Bhargav. Very good evening. Thanks for joining us. Guys who do not know Bhargav, uh, here's a quick introduction to him. Uh, Bhargav, uh, so essentially Bhargav right now is working with Google. Um, Bhargav, am I right? I'm sorry. Correct me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So Bhargav is now working with Google. Bhargav is an uh, Scalar Academy alumni. Uh, he passed out in 2019. Can you believe it? It's been three years and he's made the move to uh, the dream Mang company. Uh, so Bhargav, uh, a few questions and maybe, you know, that will help, you know, uh, give people an understanding. Okay. Where was Bhargav working before? Uh, Bhargav, I believe you were working with D Shaw uh, before you. I think uh, a better surprise for everybody would be before what I was working with D Shaw. So just tell that I was working with Wipro. Okay. And you might all, you might all think, okay, like you would be working in the 10 lakhs per annum Wipro. No, I was working for 3.4 lakhs per annum in Wipro. And now I'm at Google. So amazing, in, in, amazing battle. Um, with your story, I believe I should also look to, you know, probably change my career, do the course myself. Uh, so this is a typical example of, you know, someone ha having have had made a living example of having had made the switch from a service company to a product company, but not just any product company, a mang uh, company, Google. Um, uh, quick questions, you know, Bhargav, now to just to understand, and I'm, I'm also, you know, unaware of this, the curriculum that you went through at Scalar, do you really see, I mean, see, learning is one thing. I'm sure the, I know we teach well, so that I'm not asking. But what you've learned, does that come into use in your day-to-day -day job at Google? 
definitely i i see no place where like you know i and google is something i have recently joined it's like uh, three months uh, since i joined google and before this also i was in disha and i was there with disha for quite some time like 1.1.5 1. years and there also every day i used to put in somewhere or the other of my data structures knowledge and no joke no kidding here it is all scalar that taught me data structures awesome 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 i can see there are a few questions in the chat which stack were you working guys you should you should probably send bhargav a linkedin request uh, and then maybe bhargav can choose to uh, answer because there are a lot of questions i don't think bhargav can take all of these uh, bhargav yeah, another the questions about... are just running so <laughs> i am enjoying the chat as much as you are uh, uh, another question bhargav um how did you manage I mean, assuming you were working on the beat wepro or de shop um uh, what to, how did you manage this because i know it gets rigorous right so yeah. something about how did you manage it and how did you manage to do so well that you know google came recruiting so all i had in mind was that you know uh, i had to see at the end of the day i am doing it for myself this was the only thing that was pushing me uh, and i i kept saying like you know like some or the other you should make time for this and like if i if anybody can take out 2 to 3 hours every day like i think consistency is the key here okay being consistent with working on data structures with scalar every single day that's it that's that's enough and uh, google is no big deal i would say because uh, i i didn't feel google interview was that tough uh, the keeping in mind that you know i had i had appeared for tougher questions at uh, tougher interviews as well and according to me anybody can get google interview uh, google uh, offer as well but j- the only key over here is the consistency that you would have to maintain you know you should have the perseverance in you to keep keep the day uh, keep all your time uh, at least at least 3 hours a day for data structures caught it caught it caught it caught it caught it amazing bhagav um anything else i i think matlab any of your other experience that you'd want to you know share here would you would have thought because we knew matlab you knew you were going to come in and you know share this with uh, more than 2k folks anything that you would want them to do see it it shouldn't be about scaler also matlab anything that you yeah. the motivation what you did how you taught and how do you manage i think that should also be helpful before yeah. we go back to you know our technical class and hand it back sure. to you sure uh one thing i would like to say especially for freshers because even i was a fresher when i joined scalar i joined scalar with no experience and within a year i switched to disha directly and disha was not the first company i appeared for okay there were failures in my life before so all i would say to freshers is that you know, don't don't get disappointed with the failures that you face during the interview process there might be there might be people who purposely put down you like that that happened actually to me uh, uh, like don't don't take it as a uh, don't take it as a disappointment rather take it as a challenge i would say uh, like take a breather uh, train yourself for one one or two months more you know appear for other companies so that you can get experience and finally when when you uh, when you are uh, when you are the of the cool cool down period appear for the company again in fact disha i could not clear it on my first attempt i appeared in march 2020 i could not clear it uh then again i i kept practicing with scalar then i took an other attempt in november 2019 or oh, sorry 2020 then i i cracked it so that's what i would say you know like every success story has got many failures behind it so you don't have to be embarrassed with your failures you don't have to get disappointed dejected about your failures just just take a breather and keep working on it at the end of the day it should, it should be you who has to realize that you know you are improving on you you would have to see the change in yourself if you can see the change that's it like trust that change it will take you to it got it got it amazing bhagav thanks thanks for being here and you know probably just talking about this uh, great i uh, guys i know i know you're waiting for akhil to join back and continue with the session uh, just a quick poll um uh, shriya if you'll just launch the poll guys so there are i know you have a lot of questions and you want to speak one on one with you know with a uh, with you know our counselors one second is there's a chance maybe you want to speak one on one with a 
scalar alum also so uh, there's a poll again i think we had asked you i had shared this earlier in the uh, class also at 8 pm is if you have any more specific questions about joining scalar or uh, anything that has to do with it, because uh, you know that is the only window you'll have when you can speak one on one directly personally there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of chatter in chat we can't take each of your question personally uh, there's there's a question from many seconds he, he says share an example about someone who joined google in 2022 bhargav was someone who joined google in uh, uh, may 2020 22 so that's someone um great awesome 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 guys uh, another 30 seconds of the poll before i pass it back to akhil super um see it's it's not like guys what you're thinking is you know, the, the advertisement is happening that's not exactly what it is um there are folks who who cried foul of come in come in chat and said can you please you, you know continue with the session and that and the next thing that they do is you know write to me asking ki yaar how should i you know speak with someone or how should I? see this is your chance if you say yes you will receive a call directly you don't have to go searching for speaking to someone so make good of this chance uh otherwise you know again you'll be stuck writing to different people at scalar and asking them how to join or i want to join or you know there are there are many scholarships also that are available for early bird folks so that is also one window right now if you request someone to reach you within two or three days you can you know uh, probably get a conversation done correct that's not it sagar there are early bird scholarships apart from that also um there is another poll shri if you want to launch which is if you want to speak directly to one of our alumni and learner there are cases right when when you'll think yeah this could be you know paid activity maybe what uh, we would be paying bhargav to come here and talk to or something like that could be scripted we'll take ourselves out of the picture we'll set up a call between you and the alumni directly you can speak to them ask about the truth about scalar whether we actually do what we are telling or what we are preaching will the curriculum be completed will we actually support you in with your placements or your mock interviews or whatever we claim so if you don't want to speak with someone with scalar speak to with one of our learners or our alumni and you know probably you can see what the truth is all about scalar uh there are people who are talking about you know the investment being high or time being high 20 lakhs package uh, on an average or you know highest let's say talk about highest 1.7 crore uh, as a highest ctc <laughs> wo how will you how will that happen you go to stanford harvard you end up paying over uh, 1 cr indian rupees the type of outcomes that you're getting from this is on par with that in terms of roi fang job is never guaranteed anyone who says uh, you're getting a mang job guaranteed is uh, faking it doesn't exist what is guaranteed is your effort and that's what will eventually pay off Okay, uh, my time is out. Back to you, Akhil. You can continue with this session. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Varun. Thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. All right, Thank guys, you. we are we are back in the session. So everybody, I hope you are back from the break. We won't waste much time now. Um, okay, this this session will go on till eleven p.m. Just letting you guys know. So if you want to have a coffee, have a coffee or whatever. <laughs> okay, so uh, getting back in. I hope you can see my screen now. I am going to actually reshare it again so that in some in case somebody had like a pop up blocker on, please disable your pop up blockers. I am sharing my screen like uh, uh, disable your ad blockers, pop up blockers, all of that so that you can see my window. I'm sharing it again. Okay. So okay, uh, sorry. I've, I was supposed to share this link with you guys. So I'm sharing this link with you guys. Okay. Join this link. so all of you guys i'll expect you on this link now please click on it and join the link ppt doesn't have a link ppt will be a pdf i'll share with you in the uh, like we, uh, scalar guys will share with you in the whatsapp group okay so you have the link in case you haven't followed me on youtube yet in in case you guys want to learn uh, golang rust solidity web3 stuff uh blockchain related stuff you can follow me on youtube there's you know videos almost every week 
Uh, so whimsical access is not temporary it's forever uh, there are people who have already uh, you know already have uh, you know access to the board they know that you know all of my whimsical boards are access forever uh, and uh, no this won't be a, this won't be added as a video on youtube guys this is only a session on scalar the, the reason why this is a session like a live session because you can ask me questions or you can learn from each other's questions on youtube we don't get that uh, experience uh, and i'm able to you know answer your questions also, which we'll do in the last 20 minutes of this call, hopefully, this is the session in, in case we're able to get across this all of this content that I have for you guys. So let's get started. We have we have we have wasted a lot of time uh, talking about this board and sharing the board and all of that. Now let's actually get started. Okay, so when when you uh, start with system design, let's say you have like zero experience, right? You, ha you have no context, you're just coming as a as a as a, you know, junior developer, somebody who has like, you know, six months of experience. This is the system design that you'll draw. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is because you can see this, right? And then you'll see where we actually reach today at the end of the session. What I want to do is I want to evolve the system design uh, with, let's say, somebody, you know, somebody with six months of experience, somebody with five years of experience, somebody with three years of experience, somebody with 10 plus years of experience. How would they go about system designs? The reason why you want to see this evolved system design is because then you'll understand, uh, you know, what you want to how much depth you want to go into depending on how much time you have somebody with one year of experience they will just be in like a 15 20 minute system design round somebody with a seven year of experience seven to ten year experience or five to ten years of experience they will be in like a 30 to 45 minute of system design round 10 plus years of experience or somebody who's going for a cto level job somebody like that they sometimes would have one hour plus system design interviews right so i'm going to show you from everybody's perspective how much complexity you can add so let's say when you uh, go to YouTube, okay, and you pick up any project, like let's say React and Node.js e-commerce project or some, something like that, the very basic system design that you, that you then you draw, then you understand that how systems work is this, like you, you would have a load balancer and a forward proxy, you would have multiple front end servers, you would have a load balancer, a reverse proxy, you know, you, you have a forward, we've all learned about forward proxies and reverse proxies. So at the server side, there'll be reverse proxy and you'll have multiple backend servers each backend server will have uh, its own cache I've shown here. And then there's our, there are horizontally sharded databases, right? So when you have six months of experience, this is the kind of system design that you'll draw. But this is not acceptable in any system design interview, unless like, let's say you just have six months of experience, perfectly okay, you can draw this and you can walk out of the system design interview. That's completely okay, right? That you have, uh, that, you know, you're showing your knowledge that you have, I know that I'll use multiple front-end servers, I'll use multiple back-end servers, I'll use cache for every server, I'll use load balancers on the front-end and back-end side, I'll use forward and reverse proxies, I will use hard, horizontally started databases. Perfect, shows that you have basic uh, system design knowledge, but that's not enough to impress a uh, interviewer, okay? Now, how do you impress an interviewer? How do you actually start designing proper system designs, right? So the questions that you get around the topic, nobody will tell you to design the entire stock trading platform. We are going to do this. I'm going to do it for you in this session because uh, all of these questions are going to get covered in that kind of a uh, interview, right? In that kind of a system design. So I will, uh, you know, I have taken the pains of actually drawing the entire system design for you guys, which answers at least these four questions and many more questions. So for example, when you walk into, let's say 30 minute round of system design interview, somebody will tell you that, Hey, design the system design for a buy and sell order service or design system design for a stock recommendation service. Okay. How do you recommend stocks or design system design for, um, uh, analytic system, design a system for basic crypto exchange, these kind of really basic questions around the topic. Nobody is going to tell you design the entire stock trading platform, but I will do that for you in the session so that you know, uh, you know, you have the answers to all of these questions and many more questions. Okay. Okay. So now what we'll do is what's the first thing that you do when you get a system design problem. So let's say you walk into the system design interview. Okay. And then the, what's the first thing that you'll do? The first thing that you'll do is you'll design something called as the visible trading flows. What does that mean? That means that whatever the user is going to do on the app, that's what you're going to create a flow chart of. So user are going to, going to sign up going to have referrals, going to have verifications, reset and recovery. He can upload his documents. There can be some manual approvals. In some cases, there are manual approvals. Then there are some bank integrations, integration with his wallet where he can keep his cash. Uh, if it's a crypto platform, then he can keep his crypto. Uh, different types of cryptos, actually. Different types of wallets can be integrated. And you have your dashboard, you have your ticket price. Ticket price is basically is how many, uh, whatever, whatever currencies 
or what type of stocks are there, what are their prices, that's ticket prices. And then you have transaction history, what all you've done in the past. So in the dashboard, you have transaction history. Now I'm speaking faster. I'm going through it faster because you already have access to this board. So I wanted to zoom in wherever I am on the board. You can look at my screen also. You can zoom into the board also, but you can actually see it on the board. So I can go faster now, OK? Uh, then you have actions. You can buy and sell. You have multiple operations. Right? You have the best performing stocks, top new stocks, and you can have searching, sorting, and filtering operations. You can perform basically all these operations. So these are the visible trading flows of your system. Now, as engineers, we know that only the visible flows, you know, that's something that's great for system design, but you know, there's some invisible flows also, which the user does not know are happening, but they're happening at the back in background anyways. For example, you have, whenever there's a buy order, it goes to a queue, right? So it goes to the buy order queue. And then in the queue, uh, you send it to a service which executes the trades for you. And you can notify the service that this trade has happened. You can store that information as well. Uh, similarly, there's a sell queue. So buy and sell are two different things. For the sell queue, you have, uh, again, trade is executed that, you know, you sell this trade or uh, sell this stock or you buy this stock, sell this currency or buy this currency. All of that data has to be notified to other services like email service or reporting service or auditing service, any of that. And also has to be stored. This information has to be stored for historical order information because every user wants to see what all he did in the history, what all he did in the past. So you want to show that. You also want to ex ex inform external services through webhooks. So we've learned about webhooks. We saw that we have to inform external services and we'll be using webhooks to do that, okay? Then you have recommendation, okay. How does that come? So yeah, so you have pricing algorithm. So every, every time somebody buys or sells something on a stock plat trading platform or a cryptocurrency platform, there are pricing algorithms that are taking into account the liquidity of the uh, stocks. So like, let's say on a centralized crypto exchange, you have Ethereum or Bitcoins and you're selling Ethereum and Bitcoin. So you, you want to know how much how much Bitcoin sellers are there and how many Bitcoin buyers are there. So that's liquidity. You want to match the liquidity. The more amount of liquidity, uh, the less the prices, the less amount of liquidity, more the demand, the higher the prices, right? So that's economics 101, uh, demand versus supply. So you want to have these algorithms which are currently tracking in real time all the liquidity of your pools or your liquidity of your uh, you know, stocks. And they're uh, setting the price for all of the stocks, okay, in real time. And based on that, whatever you're buying, uh, you will also get recommendation from various algorithms. Now, these algorithms are getting trained on the recent industry news, the current affairs, and the impending, if there's any crash or recession going to happen or any boom that's coming, they're, they're aware of all of that. So it's all real-time information. Then you're going to have information flowing in from the various stock exchanges like NYSE, which is New York Stock Exchange, Bombay Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, National Stock Exchange, all of that, Singapore Stock Exchange, all of that information comes in. Uh, so you get you can buy this information. You have to buy this information in two ways. One is the API, the other is the historical information. When you get the information through APIs, uh, or, or let's say some, some information you get in historical data, you want to work with all of this information together. So you, want, you would want to uh, aggregate information from these sources. You want to clean up and organize that information because you want to be able to, let's say, show that in graphs and charts and stock indexes, all of that stuff. You want to use that for auditing, analytics purposes, creating reports, uh, all of that stuff, right? Clean up and organization happens of the data. Transformation of the data happens and storing and indexing happens. Storing, we already know storing is basically storing database. Indexing, you know, because you want to have searching easier. So that's why you use indexing. So you want to do all that to your data. Uh, apart from that, uh, we are not just considering uh, selling stocks. We're considering that we'll be selling commodities, forex bonds, derivatives, and crypto. All of that will be uh, selling. So all of that information can go into something called as a stock data service. So all of the information coming from external sources, like you know, non the NYSE on all of those APIs and historical information that we have purchased, and the web have a web hook information. All of that is going to flow into a special microservice that we're going to call as a stock data service. We're going to have all the data of all the stocks right now. Uh, that are getting traded. Then a lot of in, lot of operations happen on the stock data. You have currency conversions, multiple different currencies, right? Because sometimes what you do is you convert from INR to USD to Singapore dollar to Canada dollar to Australian dollar just to see what's the price in different countries and different currencies, depending on your preference or whatever currency you hold money more money in. Some people they hold money in USD. Some people they hold more like you know NRIs who want to stock who want to trade on let's say something like Zerodha or Indians who want to want to trade on uh, Robinhood, right, sitting in India. So we want to know what, uh, like in our currency, what's the price or in the USD, what is the price? 
Uh, and currency conversions also happens for crypto, like you know, an Ethereum versus Bitcoin versus Cardano or uh, whatever. Okay, so you have time zones and context happening there. Uh, you know, depending on time zone, what's the what's the cost, right? Or like you know, what's the time zone in which these uh, currencies getting created? And you can cache the currency information. Now, currency conversion APIs are very expensive. So you want to cache that information. You want to uh, you know, every one second or even every 15, 20, 30 seconds, based on how much money you want to burn, you can cache that information and keep showing that old information, like 15, 20 second old information to all of the users. You don't want to, you don't want to call that API every single time a user calls that API. That's very expensive, right? So the biggest hack, guys, the biggest hack to save money in any system, I'm just telling you that answer right, right away, is to use uh, caches for APIs, external APIs, whenever you integrate external APIs, don't always like whenever your users are using your platform don't make don't call external apis every time the user makes a request to your system okay make sure you always cache information keep it ready in your own uh, cache or on your own database and the user can access that information instead do that okay so um you get that information in ticker prices and then you have estimations so estimations basically mean um okay so you have done visible trading flows and you've done invisible trading flows, right? These two steps are done. Uh, whenever you're in a system design interview, those are the two steps. You want to do that before you start with everything. Then you want to estimate. Now, estimations, uh, as the name suggests, are estimations or assumptions. You always want to clarify all these numbers with the uh, interviewer. So, for example, in my case, I'm assuming that uh, there will be total number of users will be 50 million uh, in any geography, right? Any geography means any country. And the monthly active users from these 50 million will be uh, 10 million. And daily active users from these 10 million will be 2 million. And concurrent users, concurrent users are basically people who are con like active right now are 200,000. Now, you will see a pattern here. You will see a pattern that uh, I'm doing 1, five, one by 5. And here, from here on, I'm doing 1 by 10, right? So, sorry, you are, so here on, I'm doing 1 by 10. So, this is the industry standard for stock trading platforms. Now, because I had a lot of time. So I found out the exact numbers for a stock trading platform, which is that the monthly active users is usually one fifth of the total number of users on the platform. The daily active users is one fifth of the monthly active users and concurrent users are one tenth of the daily active users. Okay. So I had the luxury of time. I did all this, but uh, this changes from industry to industry. And whenever you in estimate any number, you want to check with your interviewer, Hey, is this okay? Am I, am I fair in assuming this? So you'll say no take it for a smaller scale or go, it, go for a larger scale, right? Uh, in any interview, you might, you won't see uh, the total number of users more than a billion. They won't tell you to design systems for more than a billion. That'll, that'll be too much. They won't tell you to do that. They'll be like one, two million, uh, you know, just design system for one to million. The, because that's what they're also comfortable with, right? If, uh, you know, the, the guy who design, who knows how to design system for one, one billion users, he won't be taking your interview, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, what's the average number of buy and sell orders per day per user? So uh, that's 20. So let's say that every day, 20 orders, buy or sell, doesn't matter, 20 orders are executed by every single user. Then uh, that what does that mean? That means that for all the users on the platform, which is 2 million users, which is our daily active users, so daily 2 million people, uh, into how many are they doing? 20. 20 orders they're executing. So that becomes 40 million orders they're executing every single day. All the users. Okay. Uh, total, I think this is total stocks on the platform or something. Total stocks getting traded on the platform. The total stocks traded on the platform, we'll assume that's to be 10,000. 10,000 is a big number, but we're assuming that. Uh, and uh, every year, uh, we'll have like 4 million orders, which happen in a day. And then 250 users, uh, 250 days, sorry. Uh, so 1 billion uh, total orders. So every day we know that, you know, we have uh, 4 million, right? And 250 uh, is the number of days that the market is open because you don't you don't get weekends, you get like international holidays and all that. So out of 365 days, only 250 days, it's open. And then you get 1 billion, uh, you know, sell, buy and sell orders per annum. And uh, let's say that per stock, the information buffer that we get is two kilobytes. So I've shown you what it looks like. It looks like this ticker name Tesla price 20 currency USD is going to be two kilobytes. So what's the bandwidth that's, that we require? We require that 10,000 stocks are there uh, being traded on our platform. Two kilobytes is the information per stock. So that's 20 Mbps. We need 20 Mbps bandwidth. Okay. Um, what's the bandwidth for buy and sell service? 
So that is basically buy and sell order per second and into the data buffer size. So buy and sell order per day divided by number of seconds in a day into data buffer size. Data buffer we know is four kilobytes. Uh, buy and sell orders per day we know is 40 million, uh, four, uh, sorry, 40 million and number of seconds in a day is 3600. So that means four Mbps. So we need four Mbps bandwidth for buying and selling service. So at least we starting, we're starting to get an idea about the kind of scale we're working at, right? Uh, now these, this number and these numbers are not important. At least if you are in a very short, like 30, 40 minutes uh, system design round, at least you want to get these ones these ones at least okay don't go for bandwidth and all that calculation just do at least total number of users and maau dau wau's uh, concurrent users all of that at least do, do these ones so that you have some good idea you know and uh, now this is something you're not supposed to do in an hld round but i've done it already for you anyways this is what the bid looks like the bid will have you know a price count bid type and stock id it will have uh, the bid type uh, here will have a sell and buy. So they can have two types of bids, sell and buy bid. And every bid that a user executes is going to have a price account and a stock ID, right? You know, price as in for $40, sell 20 stocks, uh, which is the count and stock ID, whatever the Tesla stock ID is TSLA and sell or buy. And the price ticker, which we'll see on the screen is going to have a time epoch, uh, which is basically a timestamp. Then you have the price and the stock ID. So this is what you've done. You've done, um, the invisible flows, visible flows, and the estimations. Now, after the estimations, this is something that you can talk about. You can talk about the possible bottlenecks. Uh, this is again something that you talk about if you like a, are a pro at system design. This is something that you would definitely want to talk about. If you are uh, learning system design and you uh, the system design interview is not that important, or you just have like three, four years of experience, um, you might not want to talk about it. It's completely okay. You can, you can skip it. If you have more than eight years of experience, seven years of experience. Uh, if you don't talk about bottlenecks, you're not getting selected. It's as simple as that. Okay. Bottlenecks basically means that preempting it's you're preempting in the planning process. You're preempting where, 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 where all the issues will exist in the system. Okay. Um, all right. So you have possible bottlenecks, which is basically, okay. So, so we have, uh, I think I've kept around seven of these. So first one is that, uh, you know, bandwidth issues. So right now, if the number of orders go up suddenly, so like, let's say, you know, people, there's, there's a recession going on. So if people want to sell quickly during a crash and uh, the number of concurrent users increases, the bandwidth will be an issue, right? So that's a bottleneck. Uh, charts are generated real time. Okay. So that can be a problem. So there's so many people generating so many charts in real time, that can be a problem. Uh, integrating with various external platforms. Now, when we integrate the external platforms, there are uh, format differences and there are also failures that happen on the external platform that can induce failures on our platform. Security issues, security considerations. There are no brainer, okay? So money is getting traded, right? So you don't want to, so security is uh, of paramount importance. This can be a bottleneck. Uh, too many network requests between services. So this we'll solve with the help of event-driven architecture, but you want to show this as a bottleneck that, hey, this can be a bottleneck. Then you want to, uh, there's going to be a lot of big data, right? Too much historical information as in all the stocks that I will either buy or sell. Uh, we have to manage all this data to make sense and use an analytics engine. So we can use data streams for that, but this is going to be a possible bottleneck. Uh, now, the things I've mentioned here, right? These are possible solutions to the bottlenecks. Uh, at, at this stage, you don't want to talk about the solution, just talk about the bottlenecks. But I'm just showing you the solution that, you know, you can solve this by event-to-end architecture, or you can use data streams to do this, and we can solve this, all of that. Don't have to talk about it in this section, actually. actually. Then you have metadata for uh, information for each stock. You have images, image processing, and formatting, all of that information required for each stock. Uh, so all of that can end up becoming a bottleneck because image information, you know, images, just the stock information is 4 KB, but image information can be in MBs, right? You have to process the images into multiple formats. You have to format the image like uh, JPEG, MPEG, uh, so JPEG and PNG, all of that. So that this can be possible bottlenecks. So you've done uh, the first 15 minutes. So now it's it's taken us just 10 minutes, but the first 10 to 15 minutes, you can, you can spend in all of this, spend in this, or even including this actually spend in all of this, okay? Now the next stage that you do is you list out all the possible components, modules and services, okay? So this exercise that you did here in uh, section four and five, where you drew the uh, visible and in invisible flows, you were doing that because you wanted, eventually you wanted the, all the list of the possible 
comprehensive and modules. So possible comprehensive modules, you'll get authentication, authorization, trading orders, search filtering, uh, sorting, data formatting, telemetry, notifications, logging, monitoring, metadata service, uh, you know, ar archiving, all of that information you will get from the flows that you drew. That's why it was uh, designing those, uh, creating those flows were very important, okay? Now, when, I, when we have information of these possible components, uh, and we have information about, let's say, separation of concern, right? We know that there should be services for every uh, different thing. So this separation of concern, we know that the business logic needs to be scalable. So that's why you need to have multiple services. Uh, we can design a naive system, very, very naive system. Naive system, basically, uh, in many articles that you'll read on Medium, on medium.com, you will see that the, the author always creates something called as a naive system design. Naive system design basically means that, okay, I don't know much about the system. And you know, let me show you what a bad or or, or a normal like a normal system design looks like. So once you have like let's say eight months experience or one year experience, this is the kind of system design that you might might draw. Okay, this is the kind of system that you'll create, where you have uh, reduced team interdependency. You'll have separate deployment and methodologies uh, and frequency. Why? Because what you have done is you have created separate services like authentication is a separate service. It has multiple servers horizontally scaled authorization service, trading orders as uh, I've shown more servers here because more servers are required for my trading order service. Search services separates, filtering and sorting. So I have shown separation of concern here. All of those servers are different. Earlier, we didn't have that. We just had like general, uh, if you saw in, in uh, point number three, you saw that we had just front end servers and back end servers that's it we didn't have like you know what type of business logic based on business logic separation we didn't have but now we have separation based on business logic we know that authentication servers are different authorization services are different trading order servers are different and search servers are different and so on and all of these servers have their own caches here as you can see they're all uh, talking to a scaled sharded uh, you know horizontally scaled database and they have multiple front end servers they uh, we're using a load balancer this time we are using uh, you know two load balancers basically and then we're also using a front end cache which is amazing so this is a naive system design so earlier we created a system design from the perspective of a six months uh, you know zero to six months experience guy now we're creating system design from the experience of let's say somewhere eight 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 months to one year kind of an experience guy this is what the system design will look like it's again a naive system design somebody who doesn't have a lot of knowledge about system design but he has knowledge about software engineering because since one year he's been like a software engineer he knows you know, he knows solid principles, he knows separation of concerns, scalable business logic. He knew, knows that if the se services are separate, you have reduced team interdependency. You, you know, separate teams can work on separate services. You know that separate deployment can happen for each of the services. And you know that you can have different technologies for each service. So what's happening here is you have, let's say you can use Python for authentication. You can use, uh, you know, Golang for trading orders. You can use uh, you know, Elasticsearch and uh, Node.js for search. So for each of these services, you can use different technology, right? So by, by one year of experience, the guy knows all of this stuff. He knows that, you know, I can, uh, by the way, if you're, if you already have one year of experience, you don't know all this stuff, then uh, you need to change your job. <laughs> you need to work in a company which teaches you all this, where you get exposure to all this. Okay. So you can, uh, you can, you can have separate teams working on separate parts of the software. And most importantly, like, you know, people with one year of experience, they talk a lot about reduced blast radius, right? They talk about how having a separate service, uh, you know, if it, even if that service goes down, it doesn't bring the entire system down, right? So that's why you have like, you know, multi, like the failure is contained. That's called as a reduced blast service. So you, you apply all these concepts that you learn to, you know, of one year of engineering, and then you design this kind of a system design. But this is still like this, you can pass uh, with this system design if you have one year of experience, so interviewer will say, okay, very good. You have passed. Amazing. But if you have one more than one year experience, you will fail if you, if you draw this in your system design interview. Okay. But why, why am I saying that the issue here is that there is no clarity of architecture. Okay. The data boy, database is a single point of failure. So even though, even though we have sharded and replicated the database, all the services are still, uh, you know, calling the same databases. There's all the data is still, uh, you know, congested in just one place. And there are no separation of types of databases because I, I might want to use a different database for search. I want, I want to use Elasticsearch for search. I want to use something else for filtering and sorting, something else for trading orders, you know? Uh, and I want to, you know, use different types of scalable technologies like streams and queues and all of that stuff. So all of that has not been considered. So that's why uh, somebody who has more than one year experience with this system design, he will fail. Uh, so how can you ensure that you 
you know, create a better system design. To do that, we will we are going to go through this uh, stage called the tenth stage, which is going to have some information about domain specific knowledge. Domain specific basically means that, let's say you are designing for a social media platform. Social media platforms they use a lot of graph databases, right, to store information. Uh, and health tech platforms, they use specific other type of technologies, SQL platforms, they use SQL databases a lot. Similarly, for our stock platforms, we use many different types of things, right? They, we use many different types of things here in stock trading platforms, and these are all domain specific informations, right? So for example, we use uh, time series databases. Uh, time series databases are very, very common to stock trading platforms. So this is why when I said domain specific knowledge, I meant things that will, uh, that are going to be used very often in stock trading platforms. Time series databases, whenever you go to, uh, an app like Robinhood, where you see all those graphs and charts, all that information is coming from a time series database. That means how the stock is performing over a period of time. Like, you know, it was $10 and $12 and it became $9 the way it's changing, the time-based information is stored in time series databases. So it started 1999 and now it's 20, you know, 18. The, the, the most important ones are influx DB are very important. Facebook has done, uh, has done, you know, gorilla DB and you have uh, time scale. You have Prometheus is also a time series database. So there are many, many time series databases that are there these days. Uh, okay. Then you have analytics engines. So we, so like I said, you know, we won't, we don't have to take the names of specific technologies that we'll be using, like Apache Kafka and Spark Streaming and Druid and all of that. But I'm just showing you here that for our analytics engine, we're going to power off our analytics engines, you know, and we're going to have real time analytics. And we can do this with the help of Looker and Apache Superset. We can use data from Kafka and, and Spark. Uh, and this is a very common practice. So we'll have to have an analytics engine in our uh, system design. Okay. We can't skip it. Then a very common thing in system design in uh, stock trading platforms is ETLs because ETLs are basically extract, transform, load systems. So you on uh, I, I said that we have to get information from these different stock exchanges in different uh, from different APIs. All the information that's coming are, uh, are going to be in different formats. Some will be in CSV, XML, JSON, blah blah blah. You know, uh, protobuf, whatever format the data will be. But in in our system for our front end to work. It has to be like one singular uh, format of data. To do that, we need ETL systems. So not I'm, I'm giving you the example of a front end system right now, but uh, even through our microservices, when they have to uh, interact with each other, they need to have they need to basically be uh, you know talking in the same format. So they're all going to have uh, be working with ETL systems. Uh, then we're going to have graph databases. Okay. Graph databases basically uh, store information as nodes. So let's say you have a node called Microsoft and then you have a node called Tesla. So here you've shown that there, there's a lot of similarity between Microsoft and Tesla and Nvidia, all of these stocks and Facebook stock, right? There, there's a lot of information and, uh, and uh, you know, similarity between them. Now, the more similarity between them, the, the depth or the number of, uh, you know, uh, lines or, or the weight between the uh, in the connections between the, the, the between the nodes, they keep increasing. So the more similarity between them, the more the, the connections between the nodes. Basically, this is how graph databases work. And Neo4j is, is one of the most common types of databases, uh, graph databases out there. Then you have real-time recommendation engines, where you know you um, you basically want to use the data that's flowing through the system to uh, make real-time recommendations. Uh, for stocks, so because somebody is buying and trading with stocks, you want them to have real-time information. Uh, then we'll be using a lot of machine learning engines because to be able to predict how the prices are going to have, you know, go up or down in the future, what is the right pricing, the, the trading strategies, all of that is going to require a lot of machine learning engines. So anybody, uh, any of you who have used a, a, an app like Robinhood before, a trading app like Robinhood before, you know that. Uh, you're going to get predictions, right? Price predictions, which app, which stock should you buy? How is it going to do in the future? And which stock should you buy in general, right? So you have real-time recommendation engines, you have machine learning platforms that help with the, with the pricing, with the uh, price forecasting. Then we'll be using a lot of serverless functions. So serverless functions take away a lot of load from our system by being asynchronous and light weight and very, very cheap. So the benefits are that they're efficient, easy to deploy, flexible, cheap, and on demand. So they do a lot of repetitive tasks 
for example uh, you have uh, uh, you know you have aws lambda azure functions google gcp functions open fast and you even have serverless databases these days dynamo db and mongo db atlas those kind of things right so what happens is that they do a lot of heavy lifting for us in uh, architectures like system, like you know uh, stock trading platforms and um, what happens is let me show you actually uh, what happens is you start with the monolith application right the, the first example we saw where we just had like multiple front end servers and multiple back end servers that was more or less a monolith application then we started dividing into services right we had like a separate authentication authorization service all of that but eventually you want to just divide that into small functions so uh, here this diagram will have you believe that the microservices transform into functions it's not like that you always have microservices and along with those to help them with some functions you have like these functions as services so these are your serverless functions which basically uh, you know don't uh, which are which are like extremely scalable because they're not actively taking up any server resources so you can tell them how much to scale up or scale down based on uh, demand and uh, they are very good with repetitive tasks so you save a lot of money so you so i told you two ways to save money in your system you save money by caching api requests you save money by uh, using the serverless functions uh logging systems in our case i've just shown you how a logging system will work so it will not only work at the server level but at the uh, application level also it will work you know so you get logs from different places you will get into log stash elastic search and all of that so you can do multiple things with logging systems what i want to show you here there is that every place like at the server level at the application level everywhere they'll be logging at the database level infra level everywhere they'll be logging we'll be using right and the logs basically go into our monitoring system so i've shown you like real examples of uh, let's say you're using kubernetes and prometheus and all of that how actual monitoring systems will look like on our system i've shown you three different examples with grafana kubernetes and you know prometheus how they look like so just you just have clarity on monitoring systems now the most important thing that a monitoring system does is uh, actually send you a slack notification or a message or an email saying that hey your system is down so that's what it's supposed to do and it's supposed to create nice graphs for you which grafana does like i said you know it creates nice graphs for you and then we all we all know about content delivery networks uh, they basically help us so all of the information right like let's say uh, people who want to download reports who want to uh, look at graphs, but also want to download JPEGs of those graphs when they compare those different stock information. Whatever that static information, like images they, they want to download and want to look at, it's all happening through CDN networks. CDNs are basically edge servers that cache the information close to the source rather than making a request always to the source server. Use store information uh, at the edge servers and that, that it's closer to the user, so they make requests here and they get the information that they need. Then you have media buckets. Now all, now all of this information, like the images for the stocks and that kind of stuff, the static image, uh, static, static information that you, you show through CDNs, basically you store them in media buckets. So for example, an S2 bucket in um, AWS, you know, you store them in media buckets. So, so just wanted to, you just had to know all these concepts before you can design a better system design. Now you already, we've already learned in our uh, presentation about uh, API gateways and, uh, you know, and service registries i'll go through them once again very quickly just as a revision so api gateways help us uh, help the ui uh, the ui server to interact with different microservices in the backend uh, from a single point of contact right and all microservices can have their own databases also and service registries are basically going to have the ip addresses of all the services that keep changing that ip addresses keep changing and uh and uh this is what i've shown you with service registry you know multiple examples how what it actually looks like okay but an API composer, it just gets all the query information, joins them, aggregates them, stores them in cache, keeps them ready. So now let's say you have one and a half years to two to almost three years of experience. What are the kind? What is the kind of system design that you will create? Right, with all this information that I showed you till now, this is the kind of system design that you will now create. Okay, you will say that there's a user, he has a load balancer, but we are also using a CDN now, and we have a media bucket to store all the. Uh, you know, images and all that, and we have CTNs to you know, help the, help him uh, download the screenshots or the images of the comparison graphs and charts and the prediction of the prices that he has done. We are going to show him with CDNs. He has a load balancers. There are multiple front end servers, and there's an API gateway now. There's a service registry now. There are API composers now, which we all know about. Then there are separate servers, uh, which are again scaled all of the servers. But but the difference, big difference here is that all the servers have their own databases now. 
okay all servers like authentication users and authorization this big uh, module this is a big module they have their own server which is an sql database so i'm storing my users information authorization information authentication information in an sql database which is uh, horizontally sharded horizontally scaled uh, i have my own cache here at the server level side then my stocks information order server is a no sql database because i'm going to have to store stocks information of many different schemas right i, I won't always have the same fields for all the uh, stocks so i'm going to have to store them in a no sql database then you have a graph database which i can use really well to create recommendations and predictions for myself uh, to the graph through cache and you know, graph database and then just a second then you have a cold storage cold storage is basically a place uh it's, it's a huge database right? it's a cold archive database where you can store information for backups monitoring archiving logging and auditing all of this all of this stuff and then you have analytics engine which where you use a time series database and use analytics and this is how you basically uh, create a system design so the benefits here are in the system design the main differences are that now that you have three years of experience you know about api gateways you know service registries you know api composers you know media buckets you know multiple front end servers load balancers cdns you know about uh, machine learning type of you know prediction uh, engines and graph learning uh, graph databases cold storage database time series databases caches for server side you have uh, different types of databases like sql no sql now this is a much uh, much better and much richer system design right so you have a lot of stuff happening here a lot of stuff is happening here uh but it's not enough um if you have like two years three years of experience you might be able to pass a system design interview with that but beyond that it's difficult so we want to go deeper now okay so now we are entering into the pro zone pro zone where uh where the pros basically pro people professional guys they they create system designs um they do that by understanding the problems so all the system designs we've done till now there's a big problem there the big problem is I will show you with an example. Example is, let's say that I have a buy service and I have a sell service. Buy service have to has to you know send some data to the pricing service. The sell service, whenever there's a sell hap that ha happens on the on the system, it sends a request to the liquidity service that you know this uh, stock the, reduce this uh, stock liquidity by one or by two or by ten stocks. Ten ten of these uh, you know st stocks have been purchased, and then you have pricing where you know based on like i told you demand and supply the price keeps changing but based on pricing you have to update prices based on demand you have to have price prediction training you have to have analytics now the problem is that you'll see these too many requests are happening so this uh, server needs to make keep making requests to this to get some data this needs to make requests to this to get some data all of them are dependent on each other they're all making requests to each other like api requests to each other right so and they all need to also make liquidity service also needs to make a request to external services the problem that's happening here is that too many requests okay now this is what i have designed for you guys but in reality in reality the microservices system looks like this there are thousands of microservices when you read the netflix blogs you learn about chaos engineering and there are thousands of like more than 4000 microservices that they have right now currently okay so they they basically you know have this kind of system it's it's a huge system and uh, here it starts becoming a problem because all of the microservices need to interact with each other. So that's the big problem. The problem is that there are too many network requests. The data formats, you know, you're using structs and JSONs and CSV. You have to do serialization and deserialization of JSON data. Too much latency gets uh, induced. You have to keep polling the APIs. You have failures. You have timeouts, error handling, and wrong responses from different microservices. So you get failures, and you want to recover from those failures. And you, they're impossible to manage. It becomes impossible to manage so many microservices. So um, the problem is that stock trading platforms are real-time systems. They should have as less delays, as less latency as possible. And we also need ease of maintenance and security. Right, which we were not getting. We were getting problems, we were getting failures, and getting impossible to manage. So many microservices, so much interaction between them. So how do how to do this professionally? What's the what's the way to do this professionally? Is is something called as a priority planning exercise. So if, like you know, in real world, when you design systems, you get your product manager and your you know engineering directors and managers. All of those guys, uh, tech architects, all of those guys into one room, and you do like a 
do something called as a priority planning exercise. What you do is you go through all these considerations. So these are all the considerations, possible considerations you can have before you design a system, which are like, you know, do you want observability? Do you want throughput? Do you want audit tracking? Do you want, uh, you know, what do you want? Do you want synchronous or asynchronous systems? Do you want stateful or stateless? Do you want high uptime? Do you want high consistency? What do you want, right? You can't have all of these. So you will take only a few of these. So what are the considerations? So you, you, also, you also have security, usability, simplicity, agility, capacity, deployability, privacy, maintainability. You know, there's so many considerations. If you want to learn about each of these considerations in detail, there are articles. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to search. You'll have to go and click on uh, accessibility. You'll have to search for accessibility in system design. Then you will read one long article about it. If you want to learn about interoperability, like if you're from a blockchain background, you already know what is interoperability, but if you, or, or maybe because that's a very common term there for web two also, it's a very common term that uh, I, I think so, not sure. Interoperability basically means that systems can work together very well. So uh, each of these terms, right? You can just go and Google and, and understand what they mean. Uh, we can't possibly go through all of these terms. More than 30 terms are here, 30, 40 terms. We can't possibly, it's, it's a, you know, it's not that long a session. We can't possibly go through everything. It's already 10, 15, my God. Okay, so we can't possibly go through all of these sessions. So you have to like uh, Google all of these and understand them, but I'm showing you what happens in the real world, okay? I'm taking you behind the scenes of, uh, you know, how a really big platform is actually designed. The system for a very big platform is actually designed. Uh, you do something called as a Moscow exercise. Moscow basically means, uh, from these considerations that you saw on the board, what are your must have, what are your should have, what are your could have, and what are your won't have. So must have in my case, now, now these things will change depending on whatever people you have in the room with you and what are the business objectives and all of that. But I've just assumed these here for a stock trading platform that you need to have obviously high availability, robustness, high performance has to be there. Recoverability, if failure happens, you need, you should be very recoverable. But should have will be simplicity, privacy, and security. Definitely, right? Could have, uh, you know, these. Now I start after below this line, right? Below this dotted line, everything is like low priority. I can, I could have accessibility, consistency, and localization, replication cross check of these. And I won't have long down times and down times and data loss and data hack. So that's my Moscow. That's my Moscow exercise that I do in the real world. Now this is not relevant from a um, like you don't have to go in the interview and start drawing all this okay so many people get confused they think that uh, i'm teaching them all this because they have to go and draw this in the system design interview you don't have to do that i'm, I'm showing you all this because the system designs that you will draw after knowing all this information will be much more refined okay this is the only reason that you're going through this with me uh, don't like don't take too much stress don't think oh i know i need to remember all this and know all this before i go into the no i'm just sh sharing all this information with you so that you're aware of how the professional people how they design systems so that you know whoever your interviewer is uh he possibly uh you know will know all this right so you also need to know all this that's that's basically i'm sh sharing with you guys uh now there's something called a stretch goals stretch goals in a planning exercise are things that you um will do once these these things are done uh, earlier, if they, they get done earlier, then you will have some stretch goals, which will, in our cases, that, you know, it's cost effective, our system needs to be cost effective. Like I, I showed you two ways of saving money, which is basically being cost effective. You need to have low latency, maintainability, and reliability. Data, whichever is update, uploaded, should always reach the database, should not get lost in, in between. Then you need to have some security considerations. Okay, so for a secure architecture, I've shown you like what a privacy as a design architecture looks like. You uh, every at every stage, at every stage you want to have a layer of security. So you want to protect sensitive data. You know you want to have uh, preventing session hijacking. You want to have uh, input validation. You want to have uh, you know fine input validation. You want to have protect sensitive data at places. You want to have auditing and logging, authorizing users. You want to ensure ensure you know only the right users get in. So this is privacy, privacy as a uh, as an architecture, and uh, privacy by design. Basically, it's called as. So uh, what we'll be doing in our case, we'll be using proxies. We'll be encrypting all the messages uh, and all the me messages. Don't uh, I, I don't mean like chatting messages. I mean like you know all the trading and buying orders. All of those are going to flow through as as messages in our system. We're going to have uh, SSL. We're going to hash all the passwords. We're going to prevent SQL injections. We're going to secure the logins, and a lot of the heavy lifting uh we'll have to do at the server side for cross scripting attacks okay so i've mentioned that also 
So these are our uh, Moscow. This is our priority planning exercise, which included considerations, understanding Moscow and stretch goals and security considerations. Once we have done that, we will come to stage 16. So everybody can come to stage 16. So we've we've gone through the problem, right? We, were, we, we saw the problem was uh, how will so many microservices interact with each other? That was the big problem. And it was leading to too many network requests. We just saw in that diagram that it was leading to too many network requests. It was becoming very difficult to uh, manage and maintain and all of that. So what is the solution to all of that? The solution is event-driven architecture. So, so guys, uh, only here with me, you've learned uh, event-driven architecture from scratch, right? Why do we have it? Uh, and and also using it in the context. So always you you'll get easy information about ES, like events and streams and queues, but learning it from scratch as to why do we use it and where did all of this come in from and what are the problems that happen, which which the which the event driven architecture solves. That's what you need to understand. Right. So here after this session, you'll have very deep knowledge about system design uh, about real time systems because and and event driven architectures because. You know, you've seen the problems that can happen. You've seen how system design has evolved, right? So the solution here with those too many requests that were happening and with in those microservices is using event-driven architecture. So for real-time systems, we always use event-driven architecture. We don't want to have our microservices making requests to each other and you know, waiting for information. You use queues and you use streams. Queues are used for notifying all the services and uh, you know coordinating with each other. Streams are used for processing data. And anything that's too heavy for real-time uh, systems, uh, real-time processing, and it's not critical enough for us. That's where we use batch processing. So we learned about uh, real-time stream processing and batch processing in, in, in our slides, uh, but now you know where to use what. And our entire system and our entire architecture has to be responsive to events. And our services, our microservices need to get triggered based on relevant events rather than a request and response. So we, we won't have a request and response system. We, you saw that on the slide, right? Uh, request and response versus event driven. So in our case, it'll be, you know, the, the services will get to the patient events. So having thousands of microservices, uh, we, which we'll have now, it'll become very easy to coordinate and execute a bot task with the help of event driven system. So, so the big solution that we are getting is that we have to use event driven systems. So uh, real time systems in our case, which is, uh, you know, stock trading platforms. Now, real-time systems, we have learned and understood in the presentation itself that, you know, in our case, we'll be using soft real-time systems and near real-time systems. We know that that much is enough. But in case you want to get down deeper into real-time systems, okay, and you want to get down, uh, you know, you want a lot of detail, I have all the details laid out for you. So if you, let's say somebody wants to understand, so I'll, I'll show you how to go through this graph that I've created for you, okay? So if somebody wants to ask you in an interview, how do you define a real-time system? So it needs to match these criteria. It needs to have precise timing, needs to be highly predictable, needs to be highly reliable. It can prioritize real-time workloads. It needs to have time synchronization between components. It needs to have very low latency, low compute jitter. Okay, it needs to have timeliness. So these are the criteria for it being a real-time system. So I've also uh, identified some really good concepts. So for example, jobs and tasks and deadlines and execution times and release times, response times, resources, all of that is out here. So this is a very, very good resource for your interview time uh, whenever you're appearing for you know a system, uh, for, for, for a company that uh, employs any type of, type of real-time systems. Uh, you need to know this, you need to be aware about this, okay? Like for example, if you're appearing for the Uber interview or Netflix interview or um, or let's say Robin Hood interview, any any cryptocurrency platform interview, you will be asked these kind of questions. You need to know all this. All right. So so this this is the big connection here that all real time systems are event driven. Now for event driven system, we have already understood that events are like messages that appear in the system. And then let's say one in one service wants to talk to another service, they talk using events rather than making requests and responses to each other, right? We looked that, uh, looked that up in a little more detail in a, in a while, but that's all you want to understand about system. System is like a unit, it is a message that you know something has happened, like you know this buy order has happened, this sell order has happened, this guy has logged in, this guy has sold 20 shares, uh, this guy wants to buy 50 shares. All of these are events that are happening in the system. And our multiple services are going to respond to these events. Okay. Uh, if you want to go down in deeper into event driven systems, you want to uh, know about all of these 
all of these terms. And I've mentioned the, the, all of these terms along with the definitions here in the, in the board itself, okay? So a lot of uh, the work has been already done for you. Don't have to read hundreds of books that I had to read. Uh, I won't say hundreds, like more like 10 books that I had to read. And, uh, you know, and all the medium blogs, all of that. So I'm, I'm saving you uh, hours and hours of like months of time, actually. Actually, years of experience because I had to go through all of this experience on my own. So I've, I've saved you years of experience right in this three hour session. Uh, in, insane value. Okay, so architectures. What kind of uh, architectures would you use? So in our case, in our case, we are using microservices architecture. Like you know, we want to divide our business logic into multiple parts, and you know, we'll have thousands of microservices. They need to interact with each other. But in case you want to understand about architectures, on my YouTube channel, there is a complete series on tech architecture, and I talk about most of these architectures there. So uh, you can check that out there. Or sometimes with Scalar, we do a cloud architecture session, and that's where also I will cover uh, most of these in, in a lot of detail. Uh, whatever you know, sales your boat, uh, we can learn about these. But if you want to go deeper into how microservices are created and how you know, we consider about microservices, what are the factors we consider? All of these are very, very big interview questions in case you have more than uh, seven, eight years of experience, you have microservices experiences, experience, you, you would want to know about all of this, how you know microservices are considered. Then what are synchronous and, and asynchronous microservices? In our case, we are going for asynchronous microservices, which are event-driven, and they're going to be highly efficient, right? Low number of requests. This is the whole point. We're going to be extremely scalable because there's no limit, because there's no request and response happening, so there's no limit. Uh, super low latency. I've also mentioned the drawbacks for each of these points, drawbacks for each of these points, okay? so. You don't have to struggle for any answers. All of the answers are on the board itself. Uh, for years to come, till you have, let's say somebody, some of you guys are at one year of experience, till the time you reach, let's say 10 years or 15 years of experience, you can always keep using this board uh, for great answers. You, you have all the answers out here. Okay, now, but the problem is that if everybody starts knowing these answers, then uh, the interview interview questions will start getting even more complex and difficult. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how, how to affect that actually. Anyhow, uh, stage 18, come to stage 18. So I've taken you through 16 and 17 quickly that you know, you've know you understood the solution. The, the problem that we had was too many uh, microservices, too, much, too many requests between them, latency, problems, failures, all of that, right? The solution we've seen in point 16 and 17, solution is that real-time systems need to use events, event driven architecture, which, which uh, can be used with uh, you know, queues and streams, stream processing, all of that. And we use microservices for microservices. You saw all these considerations, which you will go through I hope after the session is over, you will take your take out your own time. We'll go through these points properly, right? Uh, and then we'll now we're going to stage 18. Stage 18 is where I show you that uh, the big confusion between queues and streams is that uh, queues can be used for messages, events, and data, and streams can be used for messages, events, and data, right? So this is the problem here. This is where everybody gets confused. So when you create a queue, right? You can either use it to transfer messages, like messages means like chat messages, right? But some people also called events as messages, right? But they're actually events. Events basically meaning that you know this is a buy order. This guy has bought this, this guy has sold this, and you can use queues to to you know uh, basically store some any amount of data, any kind of data also. With streams, also you have message streams, uh, event streaming, and data streaming. So data streaming is like Spark. Event streaming is like Apache Kafka. You know, so uh, with queues, you get you don't have just one queue, right? So many people think that okay, I just I'll just use one queue, but that will be like a you know system failure. No, there are multiple queues. They're all replicated, distributed systems, uh, and you have producers and exchanges and consumers. Depending on where which consumer want to consume what, he will get that. Uh, yeah, so that's a queue. Uh, streams are uh, basically. Real time data is flowing through it here, and data is getting processed in real time. So you have APIs, actions, which alerts uh, devices. Now, uh, the real time processing of streams, if you want to get down deeper into that, uh, I do this session called OTT platforms with Scalar. It's a free session. Feel free to uh, attend that. So there we, we talk about how uh, real time data, which is basically the video streaming data, is, uh, is you know uh, transformed in real time. In case you want to do that, in case you want to attend that. Uh, now, here's the difference between stream processing and batch processing. With stream processing, in real time, you get filtered, grouped, 
uh, you know, data with batch processing, you get it at a particular time of the day, not, not in real time. Uh, then you have DAGs. In our case, we'll be using DAGs to run these batch operations. These are these, uh, directed acyclic graphs like uh, Apache Airflow. In, in case any of you are from a data engineering background, you've used Apache Airflow. Hopefully, uh, you would know that you would use Apache Airflow as batch processing systems to process data. Uh, so every you don't want to you don't want to process everything in real time. Okay, that will slow down down your system, and that's a bad strategy. Uh, the heavy amount, heavy stuff you want to keep it in batch processing, and the light stuff you want to keep it in real time processing. Now there is a hybrid called micro batch processing, which is like real time, but you're also you know doing the work of batch processing. So you're doing both of them in a hybrid way. Um, Spark can kind of do that for you. So along with DAGs, we can do that in micro batching. So micro batch processing is like doing everything in real time, but instead of just taking up light data, you have like you know data in micro batches instead of a big batch. Um, in our case, uh, we'll have API integration buses where we'll do some API based automation, you know, because we'll, we're working with so many different APIs. Uh, we want to have a bus which standardizes all the information, all the data for us from different APIs. Uh, then we'll be using column based databases for backup. We'll be using archives for uh, now stock trading platforms are very, uh, very, very uh, vulnerable to attacks and problems right and they also people also keep filing a lot of cases against them so uh, they, they have to go through a lot of compliances uh, so they they need to archive all of their data all of their stock trading information they need to archive it basically for audits uh, with governments later on now having known all of this uh, there are about just just like four or five more points to go four or five more points to go and then we'll actually design the final system design together. We'll go through it. So this will take us about 15 minutes. And before that, we need 15 more minutes to go, like not 15, but 10 more minutes to go through all this information. Why, why are you getting this whole big uh, bombarding of information is because you need to understand all of this information to be able to design a better system design. Like I said, uh, this is a complete system design. You, you will never be asked a question like design a complete uh, stock trading platform. You will get a small problem here. So you may have to draw only this part of the system, only this part of the system. But I have done the whole thing for you so that you have complete clarity on how the entire system and entirety works at the same time. Okay, you will because you will get just 30 minutes, right? But when you have so much of uh, context and so much of information and knowledge, you'll work in a much better way. All right. Um, so let's quickly go through all this. Now, stock trading platforms, they have something called as multi-tenancy where uh, multiple let's say let's say there's a company called ibm then they want to do some stock trading on robin hood app so and there's a company called uh, you know wipro they also want to do some trading on the robin hood app though uh, there will be many people sitting from uh, on behalf of ibm and on behalf of wipro right so they will need a multi tenant kind of an account where they have a company account in the company there will be multiple people so multi tenancy basically means that there will be multiple people uh, from one tenant from one uh, company using it so you'll have you can either give them a one database or you can have a shared database between them or you can sh share the database database but have separate schema but the best pattern is database per tenant where you have a separate database for separate companies so ibm gets their own database and uh wipro gets their own database so that whatever stuff they're doing it's only accessible to their employees and if everything gets deleted it doesn't affect what wipro was doing okay so here i've shown you different more different patterns of that uh like I said, you know, uh, apps like cryptocurrency uh, trading platforms, they they are highly competitive. They have a lot of competitors. They are highly like Binance is competing with some other, uh, you know, uh, exchange. They are not going to integrate APIs with each other because they're all selling the cryptocurrencies at different costs and different prices. So they're going to have distributed uh, crawlers. Now, this is a very common practice. Many people get very, very astonished when I share this with them. You know, all these companies have they use distributed crawlers to crawl different websites. This is a very common practice in e-commerce also. E-commerce websites like Amazon and Flipkart, they always have their um, crawlers on different websites to know how, how much that they're selling that, their, uh, their uh, you know, how much that, let's say, an underwear is getting sold on Amazon. And Flipkart guys, they need to know in real time all of this information, right? Uh, so they can change the uh, pricing on their website. So this is a very common practice, guys. Uh, 
and this is happening in the crypto and the stock exchange world as well. So you use distributed scrapers to get information uh, from across your competitor website into something called as a data lake. Data lake is where a lot of huge amount of information exists in uh, in at any given point of time. Okay. Uh, you're not storing this information or, or, or persisting this information for long-term storage. You're just uh, you just have it available in a data lake so that you can process that information. So data lake is different from a warehouse. In, in a warehouse, you store information, you persist information for a long period of time. Data lake, you just have information flowing in a place where you can you know, process it in a, in a better way. So um, these days, there is a new concept of uh, lake house, which is warehouse plus lake which is data lake house. You can do lots of stuff here. You can do BI, business, uh, you know, business intelligence reporting, and data science and machine learning algorithms, and you can, you know, get a lot of business insights from here. So this is warehouse and holding. So you want to uh, store all this information in warehouses to be able to create reports and to be able to create, uh, you know, to be able to use it for auditing. Then um, the the trading. So sometimes, you know, when you when you use platforms like Robinhood, you can set when when you want to sell a particular stock or when you want to buy a particular stock, right? You don't want to take a big loss. So you you have these rules engines, uh, which which is like a standard rule engine sitting on some server, but all the users can use it, and they can set their own rules. Sorry, whenever this uh, platform, whenever this stock is going this much down, you can sell it off or you can buy it. So I just want to tell you that. Rules engines are a very common thing in uh, stock trading platforms. Then you have algorithmic trading and bots. Now, many third-party bots are integrated with our systems, with with, uh, with our systems, and they do a lot of uh, bot uh, like trading. Also, there are first-party bots wherein our system, like let's say our platform, also like uh, if it's Binance or some some famous crypto crypto exchange like that, uh, you can. They, they also give their own bots sometimes that, you know, if you want to automate everything, you don't want to worry, you want to take those uh, trades on your own because cryptocurrency markets are 24 hours, right? So you want to uh, automate all of that. So you use algorithmic trading bots. Uh, I've, I've shown you here system designs of bots in case. So this is another question. So somebody can ask you, let's say you're going for a Web3 company interview. They ask you design an algorithmic bot or design a crypto bot. Uh, system design this is the answer for that so all of these stages that i'm taking you through like you know do a system design for uh, rules engine do a system design for uh, data lake house do a system design for algorithm trading bots you have all of that information here on this one board how do price prediction algorithm services work do the system design you have all of that here guys all of that is here available to you this is how price prediction algorithms and services work uh, we just have this diagram here because we want to be able to utilize that in our uh, in our final system design. And then we have something called as micro front end. So let's say you have, uh, you know, React developers are very difficult to find. So you have some guys who are in, who are Angular developers, some guys who are Vue developers. With the help of a micro front end uh, framework, you can get them, all of them to develop in their own technologies and have the micro front end framework uh, show that information uh, because they're all component based, right? So somebody can develop a component in React, another guy can develop it in, in Angular, and a micro front end framework can show all of that information. And the user doesn't have to know that they're all built in different technologies. So, having learned all that, now is the time to go through our fan system design. Now, there are two more topics here, which is uh, to do with distributed systems, right? I won't go into that right now. This is uh, so by the way, I take another class with Scalar called Distributed Systems. It's a free class again, if you want to get very deep into that. Uh, this is not the stuff from that, that 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 class is like very, very advanced. But um, this is just some stuff that you might want to know. But but I'll talk about it in a while. I'll take you to the system design and I'll I'll talk about this also a little bit so that you have at least some little bit of context about what all that is. Uh, anyhow, let me also check the chat what's happening. Um, okay. Um, the chat is mostly spam, guys. You're not like writing anything useful in the chat. Um, like I thought you would have to have like some question in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't see any questions in the chat as such. 
Uh, all right, so I think everything is fine with you guys. So I, are you guys enjoying the session? Can you can give me a yes if it's going great for you guys? Awesome. Okay, so some of you are saying no, I think because there's a lot of information and uh, it is difficult, but um, that's how it is, guys. It's, it's a huge platform, it's, it's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So everything looks good in the chat, okay? Uh, now what we'll do is we'll start getting into the actual. Yeah, so some of you are a little overwhelmed. I can see that um, it's it's a lot of sessions. So some of you are uh, are saying that it's too much, too fast, too much information, getting overwhelmed. But um, but that's how it is. It's it's the it's one of the most difficult. Um, it's one of the most difficult system design problems, guys. Okay. Okay. So let's get into the final system design. So some of you who are uh, who are saying they didn't like the session, guys. I know it's I know it's a lot. Uh, I know that's why you probably didn't like the session. I know it's a lot, but I request you to uh, then attend. This session, this session does repeat every like once every two months or so. So repeat, so do attend that repeat session so that you'll understand that in, in second go. It's 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 always possible that in one go, uh, not everybody will get it. I, I completely understand. So if you're not able to understand it, please join it two months uh, back. Uh, like again, okay, like two months from now, it'll, it'll repeat and please join it then. All right. So um, and and obviously there's there's no reason to not like the session because it's it's free. <laughs> you're getting all this information for free. So uh if you're not liking the session because it's too much information uh i mean who who's who says that right who says there's a lot of uh, just too much awesome stuff for free i don't like it <laughs> if you're if you're one of those guys um uh, you, can, you can just attend the session again two months from now okay all right so we have now our final system design we'll, we'll be going through the final system design now uh, now that we now that we'll go through this, you'll have so much more context and knowledge uh, and, and information that you'll be able to understand all of this at the same time. But like I said, you know, you, you're not expected to design this kind of a system. But I'm doing it because this kind of solves multiple problems for you guys. Uh, it solves multiple different, uh, you know, like multiple different problems, uh, system design problems. The answer is in this system design. So you have these multiple guys who are multiple traders who uh, are sitting in edge locations, and then you have your CDNs at different edge locations, and then you have your um, what do you call it? You have your uh, load, uh, uh, sorry, your micro front end framework, your front end, front end servers. It's like a server farm, right? Front end server farm. So your uh, front end is connected to your back end with APIs also, but with socket also. So you have uh, a socket connection, as you can see here. It's connected to this uh these streams so streams are like the backbone in this entire uh, system design so there are multiple streams and they're all distributed and, and replicated streams it's not a single stream right so it's not there's no single point of failure there are multiple uh, streams like these and then you have a um bucket and then you have a read through cache okay so bucket we already know is going to store information like uh you know the image information and, this, and the logo information of all the stocks the read through cache is going to have some information for the front front end, like you know, uh, if this was this guy, it, what all permissions does he have? What is the like? What is this guy's token? Like authentication token, all of that can be the read through cache. Then we have some uh, Redis cache for our sorting and filtering. So I'll talk about that in a while. First, let me zoom in here. This is the heart of the entire system, right? This is the most important service, which is our stocks, data, and price microservice. Okay, and all so we'll come to this in a while. But all of these services are interacting; and they're all connected to the um, streams. And when you see something like this, right? When you see this, these two arrows here, that basically means that the, in, the microservice is uh, producing events and also consuming events onto the stream. So, like I said, the front end is connected to the streams using socket, but it also going to hit the API gateway. We already know that API gateway already has uh, a you know, proxy and rate limiter. All of that is already built into the API gateway. The external systems that interact with us are also going to hit our API gateway. They're going to be connected with webhooks for third party. That, that uh, 
all, all the traffic goes then to the load balancer from the API gateway. That goes to your service registries. There are multiple service registries. I can see load balancers, load balancers can divide, help drive, divide traffic between them. And from the service registry, it first goes to the authentication microservice where the user gets authenticated. Then you get authorized where you come to know how much uh, permissions this user has. Then he starts interacting with the stocks, data, and price microservice, which is like the most important microservice here. Now, each microservice that you see here has multiple servers. The microservice itself has a load balancer, a cache uh, in the beginning itself. You have a cache here because you don't want to always hit the servers, right? You can get the information here itself. You don't want to always hit the databases. You can get the information here itself at the database level cache. So this is how each microservice is structured. Now, uh, the stocks and price data can be used by Elasticsearch for searching. It can be used for sorting and filtering, and the sorted and filtered data can be stored in a Redis cache. It can be um, like this data comes in from multiple, from data lakes, right? Data lakes, like I said, you know, you get you integrate with multiple APIs like uh, New York Stock Exchange, all of that APIs, and uh, and we are pulling uh, pulling in some information from different stock exchanges and different RSS feeds also into a data lake. From that, we queue the data uh, raw data onto a stream. Onto a stream, we uh, perform some extract, transform, and load with the help of ETL systems to get the, the data into a particular format. This ETL and transform data is going to be used by real-time analytics engines, which is going to create our dashboards, charts, and graphs for the users. Uh, we'll have separate functions as a service, like fast functions running to create downloadable JPEGs from, from chart information. Uh, then we are going to, um, what are we going to do with that data? Just a second. Okay. Then we also, from this main uh, streaming, main streaming cluster, we also are powering our monitoring service, which is going to check the logs uh, at each point of time. The monitoring service is a small service, has only two servers and a database and a time series database mostly. And it's going to uh, push the notification set up triggers in the infra wherever you know new scripts have to run to uh, build new systems and uh, build new containers, that kind of stuff, create new builds. Um, all this information, all the all these uh, this information can also be consumed by trading bots, which uh, you know can be supported by the platform or not, or some external ones as well. I've already talked about the rules engines and the anatomy or the system design of a trading bot. Also, uh, stock trading algorithms they get trained on a lot of data. They get trained on data that's coming in from multiple scrapers on data streams, and you have like machine learning engines. Uh, to to tell you how you know the stock trading platform should work, we can keep training them. Then you have a separate queue where a service for um, you know sending data to the outside world, you know to the outside world, the other systems that need to get triggered when something happens on our system, they need to be notified. All of that's happening through webhooks here, as you can see. The separate service that only takes care of uh, interacting with the external services. So and there are these um, fast, you know, uh, uh, you know, fast functional services, lambda fun, lambda functions that get triggered. They send stuff on the message queue uh, based on whatever is happening on the mainstream, whatever is happening there. Uh, it goes to the message queue, and there, from there on, you can send emails saying that, hey, yesterday you bought this, you sold this, or uh, you know, you have authorized this much trade. All of that stuff happens here. Notifications and emails. Uh, what you want to do is you want to keep pulling in or extracting data from all the databases, from all the microservices. You have a data ingestion pipeline, and you push that onto a data stream. Now, this data is also gets uh, you know extract, transform, loaded uh, you know, into a into a single format, and that raw data gets processed, prepared, and uh, you create dashboards, charts, and reports like long term reports, right? Uh, for on, as to what's happening on the platform, you store that in time series database, all the stock related information. You store that in archives because you want to keep auditing that for future purposes. And you uh, also use machine learning engines, which can predict uh, trades for you better, or predict the prices for you better. Uh, this is the entire system. Design. Now, it, it doesn't look very complex now because you, you have so much context and you've gone through the entire session with me, which took about two and a half hours. Like I said, the, sesh, the, the link will always be with you guys. Keep revising, keep coming back here. It's a lot of information to take in. I know that, uh, but I never said it would be easy. <laughs> All right, so 
uh, just just a reminder in case you're not following me on YouTube, you should follow me on YouTube. All right, so let me now take up some questions on from the questions tab. So Ranjit Sau is saying, will we get notes for this lecture? Yes, Ranjit, you have already got the whimsical board for this session, and you will also get the PDF for the system design PDF uh, presentation that I showed you. Uh, so Abhishek is saying, do we need three hours for this session? Abhishek, yes. I think by now you also agree that we needed three hours for the session. Um, okay, so Priyan Shah is saying, can screen sharing resolution be improved for your side? Priyan Shah, I'm using a capture card, an Elgato capture card, which is streaming in 4K. My camera is a 4K camera. I'm streaming in 4K. My screen uh, with the capture card, 4K capture card. My audio is, as you can see, is, is uh, you know, 4K audio, like, like whatever. So uh, the screen resolution problem like has to be on your side. It can't be on my side. All right. So what are the prerequisites for this session? Tejas is saying. Uh, so Tejas, uh, prerequisites. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. You asked this two hours, two hours back. So now it's too late for this question. Um, so Aditya is saying, are we making a stock exchange prediction model? Aditya, that's a very specific machine learning problem. And that can be tackled in a machine learning uh, session. This is a system design session. We don't have to make <coughs> a stock exchange prediction model. Um, OK, so Tilak is saying, what is system design? I'm a complete beginner. So I hope by now you know what is a system design. Uh, OK. Okay, so Ashutosh is saying, uh, in the past I've made crypto exchange and the major problem I faced was with the matching queue or matching engine. I would love if you could address this issue in today's session as the trading volume per second is too high and running. Yeah, so Ashutosh, that's a great question. You're right. Um, but uh, I think you're talking about a, uh, a centralized crypto exchange where you have to match the uh, buyer with the seller now we have dexes where we have liquidation liquidity pools we, we can you know the, the the smart contract can buy uh as you can sell to the smart contract and the smart contract can hold the liquidity pool and then people can buy from it you don't have to do all the matching queue matching engine problem anymore okay so um prathamesh is saying how is the cost estimated for such a highly skilled system how to calculate the cost system can you also do so so prathamesh you won't be asked to uh calculate the cost I think you're saying cost of building it, right? So cost of building, in case if you're like really, really curious, you'll have to estimate how many engineers will work on it, how many cloud architects, and what's the cost of your AWS or you know cloud service. All of that has to be factored in. But I'm assuming this will be like in hundreds and thousands of dollars per month to operate. Um, so Rahul Kumar is asking what is the difference between API gateway and load balancer. So Rahul, uh, I will be sharing the presentation with you and this question uh, will be answered there. You don't have to worry. Um, so Santosh Kumar is saying, is this stock market analysis class? No, Santosh, it is not. Uh, Subjit is saying, WhatsApp group is full. How do I get notes? So Subjit, uh, the, the scaler guys will take care of that problem for you. Okay, so uh, Shriya is there on the call. She will take care of that. So you will make sure you get the notes. Okay. So Tarun is saying questions to be asked to client before system design best books to go through any other learning sources, how might take it. Okay. So uh, I think Tarun, you mean questions to be asked to the interviewer before system design, design the system, right? Questions you can ask him uh, about estimations about, you know, uh, actually yeah, about the numbers, you can ask him that how, you know, for what kind of scale do you want the system to be designed? And best books, uh, there is a list of books that I can send you on the WhatsApp group. Again, you'll you'll get it. I will send you the list of books that you can go through. Uh, sources for learning system design. Yeah, go through the Netflix engineering blog. Go through the Uber engineering blog. Awesome stuff. Go go through like search for system design on medium.com. You'll get a lot of stuff there. Uh, and how to take it. How long might it take to get to an intermediate level? It's it's on practice. Tarun, the more you practice, you'll get there faster. Uh, so Anurag Pandey is saying, what language is used for system design? That's not a relevant question. Uh, Pra Prabhat, is, Prabhat is saying, can you suggest some system design books? Prabhat, yes, I'll be sending you that in the uh, in the, in the WhatsApp group. Um, Bahubali is saying, please share the PPT. It will be very helpful. Yeah, I'll be exporting it into PDF and sharing with you. 
किशोर जे सिंह हेलो अखिल यू स्पीकिंग लाइक शूटिंग एरोज ऑन रैंडम टारगेट्स या सो सम ऑफ यू लाइक यू नो सम ऑफ यू पीपल आर आर स्टॉक ट्रेडर्स और यू आई यू एक्स डिजाइनर्स एंड यू वॉन्ट अंडरस्टैंड एनीथिंग इन सेशन आई थिंक आई क्लैरिफाइड दैट देयर सो एनी बडी हु इज हेयर फॉर स्टॉक ट्रेडिंग आई एम श्योर यू डिसक द सेशन यू डिट अंडरस्टैंड एनीथिंग हेयर uh but what can i do it's it's you know it's a confusion on your part we, we thought this is a stock trading pat system where is uh, like stock trading course but it's actually a an engineering course um so ishita is saying ishitwa agarwal is saying is shard 